Hi there, my name is Aaron Short. Welcome to my YouTube channel. So you know that I do interviews on this channel and also review a lot of acoustic guitar pickups. Well, I'm very excited today because I'm joined by the one and only Larry Fishman from Fishman Electronics. And of course, he is, uh, I'm a big fan of his and I get to interview him today and talk pickups. So hi, Larry, how you doing? Thanks for joining me. I'm great, thanks, Aaron. Um, before we get going, I wanna thank you for doing these live stream interviews. I've caught a lot of them and uh, it's really uh, filling up a void right now when we're all so separated. So hats off, my friend. Really good job. Thank you for joining me. And I, this is something, you, you know, I was meaning to visit you at the factory, and this is something that I've wanted to do for a long time. So I am grateful that we have the technology to do it. And I'm grateful we also have the time. You know, we have a bit more time. Well, I do. Maybe you don't. But we have some time now to sit and do this. And I think people uh, really they enjoy to, the, the time to get away from the news and and just geek out about gear because that's you know, what we love, right? Gotcha. But thank yep. you, thank you. I'd like to start this actually with something I found online because I want everyone to go to the premier <clears throat> guitar articles that you've written. I think they're absolutely brilliant and I agree with all of them. I'm not just saying that, I really love them. And your intro on that is so good. It says, Larry Fishman holds more than 30 patents, which is probably more, more now, I presume, in transducer and musical equipment design. He's president and founder of Fishman Transducers, which he began in his garage in 1981. In the early 90s, he also co-founded and managed Parker Guitars, which I didn't know, which was later sold to US Music Corp with his friend Ken Parker. Really, really cool. So let's go right back to the beginning if we can. And can, can I ask you uh, where you're from and how you first got into music? Sure. Um, born in upstate New York, moved to North Carolina in uh, junior high school. My dad was in the textile industry. Um, Finished high school in North Carolina and in Greensboro, and then I got a degree in mechanical engineering from North Carolina State University. Throughout my schooling years, I played string instruments in orchestras. Um, started in upstate New York. The orchestra lady came into class one day and showed us all the instruments, and um, it looked like cool stuff. So I started playing violin and um, moved up to cello, which I really fell in love with. And then um, over the years, I started getting interested in um, non-orchestral music <clears throat> and took up the double bass and uh, the electric bass. And then, um, you know, really um, set my sights on being a professional musician. Uh, while I was in school in North Carolina, I thought I was going to be in the racing automobile racing industry because I had been doing that for years uh, but I got bitten really by the jazz bug I was working as a bartender in school in a nightclub all the jazz greats were there at the time because New York City was all Jimi Hendrix and the electric circus and the jazz guys were having trouble gigging in New York and the owner of the club in North Carolina a British guy we used to play at Ronnie Scott's Peter Ingram brought in all the greats, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, George Shearing, uh, you know, every single major jazz artist at the time, Buddy Rich had bands in there. And uh, consequently, I met Char uh, Charlie Mariano uh, while he was on a month-long gig there talking about jazz, music. He said, I'm teaching at Berkeley. Why don't you come up to Berkeley after you get out of school, which was a year later. And lo and behold, I did. Um, found him at the college, walked up to his office, knocked on the door. He said, come in. I opened the door. He's got lava lamps, black lights, incense burning. <laughs> He's playing some double reed Indian instrument. And he said, oh, you made it. Great. And um, I tried to enroll in school then. Uh, I got accepted, but no scholarship money. I already had a degree in a bachelor's degree so they said well we we can't help you there you're gonna have to pay tuition and so I said okay I'll be back two years later I did manage to save some money I worked um, for the government US Department of Transportation on uh, as a mechanical engineer worked on high-speed air levitated 600 mile an hour trains pretty interesting stuff but um, saved every penny went to Berkeley um, degree in um, composition and um, bass performance. Didn't quite finish it, got through about four years, then went on the road and uh, was gigging. 
mm-hmm. and everything was good. Single guy, uh, having lots of fun, touring, doing great jazz venues, this and that. Uh, ended up back in Massachusetts, living in Cambridge, working bars, the bar scene and so forth was pretty good at the time. But there was a transition going on. Um, we had a quintet, jazz quintet, and uh, at that time, um, this was about 76, 77, uh, there was a transition going on in the clubs. They they figured out that the stupid piano players would bring a Fender Rhodes in so the club could get rid of their piano. They didn't have to pay for the tuning of it, everything. So everything changed. And uh, it reached a point where in my quintet, um, things were getting louder. And they said, God, you got to play Fender. And I wasn't interested. I told them, no, Fender's <laughs> belong in cars. <laughs> And uh, it became a year-long search for bass pickups. I bought every single one you could get, and they were marginal at best. And uh, I'd always built engines and cars, and uh, I I ran hobby shop modeling departments when I was in high school and stuff. So I always made things, and I was probably the only bass player with a small machine shop in my basement at that time. So uh, I took a deep dive, discovered piezo materials, and um, started making double bass pickups. Um, that was a hobby. I'm making them for myself. They work quite well. Um, my friends were asking for them. I had an injury in my machine shop that put me out, out of playing for about five months. I damaged some fingers. And um, nothing permanent, but uh, I broke some bones, uh, fingertips. I couldn't play. I took my bass to a bass repairman. Uh, to have some cracks fixed and so forth. And he called me the next day. He said, wow, this bass pickup is amazing. Where'd you buy it? I said, I'm making them. He said, well, make as many as you can. I can sell them to all my clients. That's what started me down the road of um, making musical instrument Mm -hmm. gear. And one thing led to another. Um, Started figuring that out, incorporated as a business in 1980 or 81, I believe. Um, that was quite accidental. My father was responsible for that. Uh, he came to visit, and uh, we were driving from Amesbury, Mass, into town in my old Volkswagen Beetle. It was pouring rain, and the the car was a death trap. The floor was all rusted through. By the time we got into Boston, his feet were soaked. <laughs> we got back, and he said, look why don't you incorporate this little business thing of yours and I'll be an investor. Mm-hmm. I'm going to invest $20,000. I want you to buy a car so you don't kill yourself and pay you, pay yourself a, a little salary this year. He still owns 20% of my company. Oh, wow. today. <laughs> Good investment for him. Mm-hmm. So that uh, was the beginning. Um, I was still playing. I played for many, many years as I was building the business. Um, I was playing in theaters in Boston and clubs and so forth, and the jazz scene was really strong in Boston. I was one of the upper-tier players at the time. Life was good. Um, I got a call from um, a guy in Australia. Um, He said, gee, my name's Joe Hayes. I read about your bass patent, um, your pickups. He said, I've designed a preamp. I want to show it to Martin Guitars, but I need a pickup. So I said, fine. And I developed our first guitar pickup, which coincidentally was a soundboard transducer for that project. And we still sell it today. It's called the SBT or the SBT-1. We mostly uh, sell it to people that um, it can be used as a piano transducer. And it works really great on um, harps, full-size harps and Celtic harps and stuff like that. I was never fond of soundboard transducers for acoustic guitars for a lot of reasons. Uh, We made that. It worked well. Uh, He took everything to Martin, and um, he decided they didn't like his preamp, but they liked my (laughs) (laughs) So Lucky you. (laughs) Guy at Martin, um, John, uh, I'll think of his name in a minute. He's a great guy. Uh, calls me one day. Oh, right before that, the the guy that helped me sell bass pickups to um, the local music stores was a drummer doing general business music in Boston. 
And uh, his bass player bought one. And he calls me. He said, "Hi, I'm um, uh, Leroy. Blah blah blah. I um, I love your pickup. I can help you get him in the stores. I'll, I'll do a great deal for you. I, I I'll rep you for thirty five percent. Well, <laughs> it was absurd. The number. It usually should be by ten percent or something. But I said, "Fine. Go ahead and do it." Started selling them in stores placed ads in the musicians' newspapers in the major cities, opened up a mail order business for bass pickups. And um, he called me one day, the same guy, and he happened to be an independent rep for Guild's Guitars. He said, look, Guild um, uh, is looking for a acoustic guitar system. They're buying something from a West Coast manufacturer. It happened to be Barcus Berry at the time. Uh, they're not happy with the pickups or the business relationship or something. Can you do anything? And I said, you know, I don't even really know much about acoustic guitars. Why don't you lend me one of your guilds and I'll see what I can come up with. Mm. And basically that started it. I ended up taking what I had put together. It was just a pickup down to Westerly, Rhode Island. Mark Drange was running the company then. He was the son of the founder. And um, they listened to it, checked what they had. They said, great, we'll take 500 of them. I mm. said, no problem. So I left Westerly thinking, holy crap, how am I going to build 500 of these? The next day he calls me, he says, oh, by the way, uh, the, the stuff we're buying from Barkersbury also has a side mounted preamp and they won't sell it to us. If we don't buy their pickups. So you can provide that too, right? I said, sure. No problem. <laughs> I had no idea. Say yes now yeah. and then deal with it later. It's <laughs> a good well, lesson. I, I knew a guy from the local, uh, there's a little Irish pub in town where we're playing jazz on weekends. And I knew a guy there, Richard Brisman, who was a electronics designer. I got him to whip together a preamp circuit for me. I did the mechanics. I etched all the first 500 sink, uh, uh, circuit boards and ferric chloride in my basement laundry sink. Uh, big violation of all the pollution stuff. I drilled all the holes with a drill press. I put it together and it became the guild, I believe they called it the TAS, T-A-S system. That put us into the OEM acoustic business. A year later, John Marshall uh, from Martin called me. He said, you know, I saw some of your work when the Australian guy showed us his preamp and stuff. We are looking for a um, non-invasive installable 332nd wide pick up to put in Martin guitars. It's got a fitness standard saddle. Mm -hmm. So all the other stuff out there is really too big. Can you do anything? And he said, we've called all the people we know. They called me, they called Lloyd, they called Joe Marinich from shadow. Um, you know, that was the list. Uh, I flew down to Martin with what I had built about two weeks later. Um, John Marshall took it, was looking at it and straightening out the wire and broke it. <laughs> uh, I, I went back home to Boston came back two days later showed it to them they had a big shootout and they said wow we like what you got mm. we want to take it to the trade show which was the summer show I believe it was in either New Orleans or Atlanta it was a non-traditional uh, venue for NAM. they came back called me Hugh Bloom Chris Martin was not with the company at that time oh, really? not, wow. no Hugh, Hugh Bloom was the um, president. Chris's father had retired. I, I did meet Chris. He was laying on the ground under a machine doing something. <laughs> <laughs> but he, I think it was a summer job or something. He was still getting his degree at Boston University, I believe. Right. Um, he called me. He said, uh, look, the pickup really sold well. Um, can you produce 10,000 of them next year? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so at this so I, point, were you still, were you building these yourself at that point? Or did you have like a I small, was, um, you know, the bass pickups were moving qu quite well. And I had designed a violin pickup as well. In fact, that's how I met Ken Parker. One of his apprentices was making electric violins and Tucker Barrett actually found me. I made him a violin pickup. Then he introduced me to Ken. But I had a little shop in the basement. There were three of us down there, myself, um, Ralph Rosen, a blues drummer that I worked with, and of all people, Reeves Gabrels, who went on to fame with David Bowie, and he's uh, a per permanent member of The Cure now. He was in Tin Machine. 
one of the best guitar players I've ever met in my life. He was working there too. And I met Reeves because we were doing pickup cover bands for a country and Western band at a place called the wagon wheel mm. <laughs> in Boston. <Yeah>. So, <laughs> uh, I told my wife, look, uh, I'm going to have to bring more people. And she says, no way. Let's go find a building. And she went out herself, rented 5,000 square feet, about 20, 10 minutes away. And I remember walking into 5,000 square feet. It looked like Madison Square Garden to me. My heart was just going, oh, my God, what have I done here? Wow. And um, ended up buying a lot of used workbenches, hiring. Everyone was a musician that worked for me at that time. We built up a crew of about eight people and started supplying Martin um, wow. with the second generation 332 pickup. And that was the beginning of the relationship. And it worked so well, they kept coming back and asking for more. Um, they asked for a preamp, like, I believe, I don't even know what they had in mind, but I designed a three-knob system, kind of like up on the upper bout, not exactly where the Taylor stuff is, but in that general area. It was actually two knobs, a volume knob and a stacked tone control. Um, so it was pretty non-invasive. Uh, is this design. sorry? Is this pickup? Is that like? Is it like the Matrix then, or is it is it different? No, Matrix was probably. You know, I have dates here because I thought you might be asking this stuff. Yeah. Bear with me one second. Matrix um, came in uh, 1991. The Thin Line, which was a ceramic pickup, was 1986. Okay. Okay. Um, and. Uh, the matrix is a whole other story, but, uh, so we had the two knob system and then they started asking, they, they, they got quite enamored with what Takamini was doing with the side mounted preamp mm -hmm. and Takamini was really, um, they had major, major promotions going on in Nashville. They were giving everybody with a cowboy hat, a guitar or two. And they were taking the whole scene over because these guitars would be plugged in and played on stage. And, you know, people loved it. The touring guys went crazy over them because they didn't feed back. They sounded reasonably good. The instruments were meh, all right. They weren't great. They built better instruments later in their history, for sure. But, um, and I just started getting, so Martin said, can you design us something to go on the side like that with more controls? I said, sure, I'll go to work on it. And, um, at that point, I had previously, a week or two earlier, had another meeting with Guild. They were asking for the same thing. But the Martin was a more serious account. So I got a guy named Ed Britt here, who's an industrial designer, to help me with the cosmetics of the um, of the preamp. And, you know, kind of design something that... <laughs> and Ed was a, an acoustic musician. He did lots of inlay for the high-end um, uh, banjo uh, companies and so forth. He's a banjo player. So I said, look, Ed, it's got to look good on a Martin. you got to help me with this. You really have an eye for that type of design. <clears throat> Brought it to Martin. They absolutely loved it. And I told them that um, they could have an exclusive. It would be molded to fit the bout, upper bout of their guitar perfectly. But they would have to pay the tooling cost for the molding because I wouldn't be selling it to anyone else. And there was a price tag on it of about $20,000 for the tooling. And they said, no, we, we would never spend anything like that. What was that? What was that preamp called on that guitar? I'm just trying to find a picture of one on, on that Google. That was a, um, AG, AG1. It was a simple name. It was not an actual barn door. It was a, um, um, it was a curved plate. Um, AGP2. AGP2. Yeah. Um, and lo and behold, Guild was asking for the same thing. And so was um, Gibson and Taylor and Larravee. No one wanted to pay for the tooling to customize it for their guitars. So I said, boy, I think there really is something here. I went out. I made the investment myself. I redid the design so that the bezel would be bendable and it would fit all the different acoustic guitars out there. And um, tooled up, um, built up samples with Martin's logo on it, Guild's logo, um, Taylor's, 
Gibson, Larravee, they all bought them. I was suddenly in the integrated pickup and uh, preamp business in a big, big way. Um, that led to uh, expanding the business, moving um, uh, into different designs, and eventually, and that would be probably in, and let me look at my dates here, ba -ba -ba -ba, 1996. Are you having trouble finding that? I'm, I'm just showing, I should have done this earlier, sorry. I'm just showing the SBT, the Sandboard um, Transducer Pickup. And then I'm, yes. I'm, then I'm going to, just so they've got an idea of what we're talking about, I'm going to show the 332. They can see that right now. That's the thin okay. line. They can see how it goes into the saddle. And I'm going to show the AGP2, which is like a black box with two knobs on it. Is that right? That was the original one, and that was – so I, it was actually something else. It had sliders on I can't remember the name of the very first preamp at this point, okay? Yeah. But the AGP-2 was a – it was in a black box, but we were also selling the unboxed version that got installed in the guitar. Right, right. Yeah, awesome. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. And I'm sorry I can't remember the name of the first one. There's been about – 50 to 100 systems that we've put into OEM guitars over the years. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. but uh, in in um, 96, uh, people were asking for different features on the, on the control panel. And some Japanese companies were starting to make things, Nan Nanyo, Boeki, and there were little things showing up. <clears throat> but the problem was all the features they wanted – these things were starting to get really big to accommodate all the controls and a battery compartment. So I came up with the notion of the um, hinged, which became, quote, the barn door, affectionately or unaffectionately. <laughs> and, and what that did, it actually got the battery compartment off the front panel. So it allowed you to have a lot more controls on the um, footprint of the front panel. And it just flipped open, and you could change the battery instantly because it was on the back side. Yeah. And that became wildly popular, and it was we did it in multiple versions. Um, and the big one that really, really did well, we did for Taylor uh, first. Everyone else bought similar systems, but uh, it was our uh, onboard stereo blender. And it had uh, under saddle with all the controls. Uh, it had a microphone built onto the back of the preamp and blend controls, um, <clears throat> parametric mid, bass, you know, all of this stuff. Oh, and we were the first company to actually realize the value of having phase switches on acoustic instruments. Mm. That was pretty accidental. I was working on an offboard system, the Fisherman Acoustic Blender, for a, a, a fingerstyle guitar player <clears throat> or flat flat uh, flat picking player uh, singer songwriter Harvey Reed, a uh, guy from Maine, and uh, we did a system which had a small crown GLM mic in the sound hole, under saddle pickup, and he actually came to me with the concept. But he had 15 boxes and a million wires, and so I went ahead and designed a blender that would mount on a mic stand that had two two channels of EQ and volume. XLR ends, effects loops, and so forth. <clears throat> and that became a, a product for us. But Harvey was calling me saying, Larry, I don't get it. Some nights this thing sounds amazing. And other nights I can't get anything happening. I got feedback problems. It's driving me crazy. So I went out to several gigs with him. And I suddenly realized that there was no phase compatibility or standard in house PA systems. Mm -hmm. Some were phase positive, some were phase negative. And I said, you're out of phase. That's what's going on. So I put a phase reversal on there. Bang, it just fixed everything instantly. And that was, that was a, you know, Aaron, working closely with, with working musicians, really being in that environment, you really get to see what's needed and what's, what's fantasy and what's necessary. And, you know, a lot of the success we've had is due to the fact that we, we have a huge number of relationships for people that tour on major, major tours in the rock thing. I mean, we got involved with Pete Townsend years and years and years ago through his tech, and he brought me out to gigs. He said, Pete is having trouble with his acoustic guitars. What can you do? I said, what's the problem? And we talked about all the issues, so we really um, learned a lot there. Um, Pete was responsible 
for um, tweaking the design on our power bridge, which is a piezo bridge system. I developed it for Parker. It was the first commercially successful piezo electric guitar system, but we came out with Fender style replacement bridges, and um, they're were, they were breaking strings because of the saddle design and the insert design, and I couldn't believe they were breaking strings. And so I go to Pete's gig, and we're there before the gig, and I said, show me what's going on. Well, the tech picks up the guitar, and he does this <laughs> windmill like Pete would do. He hit the guitar harder than anyone on the planet ever hit a guitar before. And sure enough, the high E string popped. And I said, oh. <laughs> so I go back, and this I have to laugh about this. I couldn't believe it. I could barely make it happen. Couldn't see what was going on. I took a microscope apart, taped it to my forehead, so I could have 5x magnification and sat there and wiggled that string as hard as I could on a bench. And I could actually see the string change color and work harden at the witness point until it popped. Wow. And I figured, okay, i got to increase the radius there. But mm. I never would have done that without input from those guys. Ever. Of course. And, and my, this whole YouTube channel and my whole obsession with this and, you know, seeking you out at NAMM and everything – came from playing in different venues in but you know I don't play I don't play big stages but I play bars and different bars and actually they can be some of the most challenging places because you're stuck in a corner and you know what sounds good at home <laughs> through headphones in fact I feel like a lot of things sound good at home at low volume finger yep. fi soft finger picking low volume headphones 99% of stuff sounds great but once you go out and you turn it up and you go into a certain room that's a whole new ball game and that's really been what I've based my kind of reviews and, and this channel about, the live aspect of it as well. well. That's what, you know, we focused on that for years. I mean, that was our main focus is live performance. And uh, the market has changed more and more and more people are plugging in at home. And the requirements are far different than uh, live and on stage. I mean, we used to get slammed for not being warm enough sounding. Well, it means we didn't have a big flubby bottom end that just does not work in a nightclub or something of that nature. At home, fine. But for a while, I always felt, well, why are you even plugging in at home? If you want to record, use a microphone, yeah. for Christ's sake. It's going to be better. But that's certainly changed. People mm -hmm. love gear. and Looping uh, effects. Even before that, just the, the very basic fact that um, the instrument has – greatly increased dynamic range when you plug in yeah. allows you to do things that you can't do when you're not plugged in. Yeah. I had a, I had an argument with a guy once cause I, I said, he said, well, my guitar sounds louder than yours. And I said, but mine's got a pickup system in it and it's probably affecting the, the tone and the volume slightly acoustically. And then my argument was, yeah, but I can also plug this guitar in and be massively louder than you can ever be. So yes. you've really got to decide what the purpose is. And actually, it's funny because I do plug in 90% of the time at home just because mm -hmm. I want I want those effects. I want to loop. I want to record and sure. things like that. But I really want both. I really want a system that works great on stage and can also um, be recorded and sound like a mic as well. But we'll, we'll get onto that later on. So, look, I have one of these here with me. Can you see it? Yep, I can see it. <laughs> actually, it's so thin it doesn't quite focus there. So mm -hmm. this is the Matrix. So this is this is probably what you're known for the most, right? So why, well, that, when was that developed and why? Uh, that was developed, I released it in 1990 or 91, a little foggy on the dates, but I think the patents started issuing in 91. Uh, under saddle pickups were always problematic from a balancing point of view. And um, when we got involved with Martin on the thin line system, I guaranteed that 100% of the pickups would work and they would be balanced and that if a dealer was having trouble, we would counsel the dealer and train the dealer. And if they were still having trouble, we'll take everything back. 100% guarantee. I knew that was the only business proposition that would propagate and, and, and work. And for a year or so, it was a nightmare, man. We got so much stuff back because no one knew how to install them. And part of the problem was guitars have different string spacings, so the pickups with individual ceramics in them had to be placed exactly in the right spot. And people were a little cavalier about where the placement was. So they're not under the strings. Uh, 
Ceramic had to be small elements because it's quite fragile and a long bar of ceramic will break under the string pressure. And um, the, um, you know, the issues, we have many different sizes. It was, you know, a, a pretty, pretty problematic situation as far as getting string balance. And um, I said, God, we need something that senses, is a unitary sensor that'll sense the entire saddle. So position is not an issue. And I said, there's also information in that saddle that's not directly under the string that I want to start hearing. So um, I started looking at alternate materials. I uh, got a hold of some samples of the first piezo films, the PVDF films. Um, and I made some pickups out of them. Uh, they kind of worked, but they required <coughs> a D33 mode, which means stretching rather than squeezing. And uh, that means you had to put rubber under them to allow them to stretch and comply. Do you remember the first, uh, I think uh, Lloyd had a ribbon transducer and there was a little strip of rubber under it because he was using PVDF. And the only way you could get PVDF to stretch was to put something compliant under the saddle, mm -hmm. under the film. I didn't like that approach because it was still a little iffy as far as getting to stretch and it definitely killed the acoustic properties of the guitar. So, yeah, that's something he said. He said um, they developed the element pickup because it's but it's just a big, soft, flexible like cable yeah. that you can't you can't break it. I guess the weak point on the matrix would be where it joins the. But then, yeah, that's a really tricky joint. Their matrix is made out of minimally invasive material. The mm. the red stuff is actually a uh, metalized paper. In mm. fact, um, uh, the red is just a dye. You can get it in different colors, okay? Mm. But there's a uh, film of um, uh, of aluminum and uh, uh, sputtered onto paper. And paper is the closest thing to wood that I know of. So there's nothing bouncy and there's no rubber involved there. And the whole thing is held together with a one thousandth thick layer of hot melt adhesive that gets very hard when it dries. So we try to maintain the stiffness of the material throughout the construction. It's a real trick to make. Mm. I designed those 30 years ago. I can't even see them anymore to solder them. Uh, you know, my assembly people are amazing at them. It, it's almost magical to watch it go together. Mm. Um, but it's, you know, it's delicate. It's like a good guitar. You don't want to take a good guitar and throw it around the room. Mm installed properly you're good mm. if you start yanking saddles out while there's still string tension under there and things of that nature yanking on wires you're going to have issues mm. if you just leave it alone it'll do its job and i've had systems together for over 30 years that are not complaining at all yeah <clears throat> I've, I've never had one fail now it's interesting what you said and i don't want to i don't want to um I don't, be, I don't want to say the wrong thing or disrespect. I, I, I love, I'm a big fan of the Anthem. I'll put that out there. It's one of my favorite systems. But um, I do ask all my guests on here if they feel the, that kind of pickup affects the unplugged tone. And most people say no. I think it does. And I think you agree with me, with me right? Have you ever done any tests on that? Actually, oh, yeah. You have it's, done? It's, yeah, it's dramatic. I oh. mean, we make a okay. braided pickup. <laughs> we have a sonotone pickup, which yeah. is our value-based system. And um, they're good enough that we sell about 700,000 pieces a year to various guitar companies. Where the guitars go, I have no idea. But that's a big number from our perspective. Sonotone pickups have a braided shield. Mm. They have the same sensing material as in a matrix. Mm. But because of the construction, they're very easy to put together, very quick, lower cost, brutally strong so if you send them to an asian factory they can just yank them in they're not having issues solved a lot of those commercial issues um but from my perspective they absolutely dampen especially the high frequencies of the instrument acoustically they just it's like putting a blanket on the instrument yeah. from my ears yeah. uh one thing they do do is they enhance the bottom end because they're kind of bouncy mm. And they can make a cheap Asian-made guitar, a, you know, a low-cost Korean or Indonesian guitar, sound better yes. and bigger. But they certainly don't have the detail that that little red guy has. And um, 
depends on what, Aaron, they're perfectly fine for a lot of things. But if I'm putting something in a $2,000 guitar, I, I don't want to put something in there that's going to kill it. I agree. One thing I've learned is there's always a trade-off and a compromise. And the thing, yes. the thing is with that pickup, sometimes you want the enhanced bass. Like on a smaller body guitar, live, you might want that enhanced bass. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. And you know what? Some people, if you gave them an AB comparison, might even prefer that what it does to the tone. So there's no, there's no, there's no right or wrong. But I am glad that you have that same, um, you know, just just from putting them in, taking them out, and, and I know there's a lot of variables, but I do think sure. when people choose a system, they should factor that in. Obviously, you've yeah. got to factor in where you're playing, what you're playing, and what your guitar means to you, how much modification. I mean, Lloyd said to me, there's guitars he wouldn't put systems in at all because he believes that they should just stay acoustic, which is also fair, yeah, fair enough. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, even to this day, and I'm not putting anybody down, but a lot of people don't really know what their guitar sounds like because they're sitting behind it, and they don't realize how much brighter it is in front of the guitar than it is behind the guitar because of the way the highs propagate. So when you put a pickup in a guitar that maybe comes closer to that, characteristic of what's coming off and also is responding quite quickly it freaks people out they're too revealing in many regards and they're much more comfortable with a more muted slower responding pickup that's fine yeah yeah but um you know i've, I've seen that i saw that with our um, electric guitar pickups people they're so revealing that some players they, yeah. they, they can't deal with it yeah so it's also what you're used to for sure that's so cool. that seems like a good transition into aura because with aura you're basically getting the sound of the mic in front of the guitar right through the pa sure. so right. let's talk about that and also we've we've done a lot of talk about impulse responses because i'm also in i'm into like the helix and the kemper and the electric players are all into their impulse responses it seems that the acoustic world is this year particularly is going into impulse responses and i've always i've always said about the aura it was so ahead of its time. I don't believe people really understood it at the time like they would now because everyone's talking about impulse responses now. Mm. So, and another question for you, I've been trying to do some research and no one knows the answer yet. Maybe you know the answer. Who developed the first, actually I've got two questions. Who developed the very first ever acoustic guitar pickup and who developed the first use of impulse response technology in an acoustic guitar? Do you know those? Yes, I do. Hmm. First acoustic guitar pickup on record I don't know the inventor's name, but it was invented by the Baldwin Company, and they were selling guitars at the time. Mm. And uh, that pickup is, coincidentally, the pickup that's in Willie Nelson's nylon string, whatever he calls it. Trigger, trigger, yeah. Trigger. <laughs> uh, yeah. And what happened there was um, Glenn Campbell was quite, the quite the personality at that time great studio player but he also had a tv show and charlie command from command industries who tried to buy martin guitars and they wouldn't sell it to him so he started ovation because he was pissed off mm -hmm. uh charlie knew glenn campbell he said look i'm making a new guitar and i want you to endorse it for me and play it on your tv show and it was a, a weekly show he had and he said, yeah, but, you know, I got this pickup thing in this guitar from Baldwin. And uh, if you can make me something like that and put it in the ovation, I'll do it. And um, he got uh, James Ricard was a engineer that was working for the command helicopter division at the time. And Charlie said, James, can you figure out what this Baldwin thing is and make us something similar? And James did. And he filed for a patent on it. So the first one was Baldwin. The actual first piezo pickup I ever saw came from 30 years earlier or 40 years earlier, and it was for a viol electric violin, believe mm. it or not. Yeah. But th that's the first. As far as impulse response, I, I'm pretty sure we were the first. I mean, I know that um, uh, Rick Turner came out with Mama Bear about six months out after we did we showed it at a um in i believe it was 99 at a summer nam show and rick was in my booth looking white as a ghost <laughs> 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 couldn't couldn't get his hands off but 
he had been working on something and we got to market before he did. Mm -hmm. He did Mama Bear, which was a different approach than what we did. I think we were the first. We did file and uh, for our patents on that in 99 and they were granted. Mm -hmm. And um, so historically, I think that's an approximate thing. I mean, hadn't seen anything before that. I know that Yamaha had a acoustic guitar preamp with a modeled microphone in there, but it had nothing to do with doing a convolution on the guitar. They had taken some um, different studio mics and modeled the um, the characteristics, the dynamic characteristics of the mics, mm -hmm. and then plugged into that. So it was just a mic modeler more you know, rather than a guitar model. So where did, I'm, I'm just fascinated. Like, where did you get the idea? For, like, what's the story of how Aura came about? Can we have that? Oh, I, I'd reached the point with pickups. We, we were on our fifth generation of Matrix and mm -hmm. doing Sonotones and SBTs. And I, I got kind of, and pickups were getting kind of the point where they're all pretty decent. You know, people learned how to make them. It's kind of like wine tasting. I didn't think you're ever going to get a pickup that would be just a huge leap just from, you know, tweaking the materials and this and that. And I, I said, we, we really want to do something different. I know that the guitar, uh, the sound from the guitar develops in front of it, the way it propagates into the room and radiates and so forth, number one. Number two, guitars that are recorded with high-quality microphones sound great, just undeniably. All the records you hear are done that way and also people love microphones for some reason there's a whole romantic involvement with the old neumanns and the old german mics and the russian mics and you know these um old ribbon mics because there's there's so much character in all these mics i said boy i really want to do something like that just not sure how to do it yet um i met somebody um who actually called me because of another patent I had. And this guy said, look, I've designed a MIDI pick. I need a transducer. I said, what's a MIDI pick? <laughs> he said, when you squeeze it, you can uh, modulate filters and so forth. That's interesting, and, actually. Yeah, it was. I said, well, why would you want to do that? And he said, well, the way he looked at it, he, trumpet players, they start a note with their lips, and then they modulate it with their lips. Violin players start a note with the bow and then they can make it louder and softer. He said, guitar players do this and then they have to mm. <laughs> stomp their feet on something. And he said, I think you get a much more natural response of opening fit filters and stuff. So I want something that can control MIDI controllable multi effects processors, envelope filters and things of that nature. And I want to control it with a pick. And he said, I saw these patents and you happen to live three blocks from me. Can I come over? He did. I looked at his project. I said, yeah, I can probably do something for you. Not a problem. What do you do? And he did um, signal processing for the military, for the Navy. Um, did um, wide aperture sonar underwater work. He was a MIT physicist grad and this and that. And I said, well, look, I, I, I want to barter here. I want you to help me build an instrumentation lab at Fishman and I'll make my pick. And he said, why do you want an instrumentation lab? I, and at that time, I wasn't thinking aura, okay? I'm, I'm thinking, because <clears throat> every time I change a pickup in a new design, it's take it out of the guitar, put it back in, listen to it, try to remember what it sounded like 10 minutes ago. You can never get two guitars that are identical enough for doing ABs. It was a maddening process, tweaking pickups. It would take weeks to finally come to the conclusion, yeah, this one's better than that one. I said, I've measured every way I can, FFTs, uh, waterfall displays, uh, distortion. I, I said, I need something because this process of designing by ear is driving me. It's making me prematurely old. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know what you mean when, you, when, when I've experimented. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've got Evan on tomorrow who does my guitar work here. But, you know, sure. you take it, you're absolutely right. And that's the whole thing with comparing as well because you take one out. And then you put it back in and you think, well, has the action changed? Has something changed? And what did it sound like before? And that's a, that's a big factor, I know. Yeah. Um, so, at, so he said, fine, I'll do it. You know, and so he's 
recommending equipment for me to buy and some software products and Wegner functions and stuff that I had never heard of before. And then all of a sudden, he, and I made his pick, and he calls me one day. He said, Larry, I think I know, and I've been talking to him about this whole microphone concept. I said, well, can I do this with signal processing? He said, only digitally, you know. I said, boy, that's tough. We don't do digital. And uh, he called me one day and he said, look, I'm at a radar conference and this Russian guy is giving a presentation on um, um, vector, mode ra vector mode radar analysis. He said, I think that'll get you what you need for your or Wow, that's or your. crazy. And as it turned out, it didn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> it started us down the road. And I said, fine, like a nut. I dove in. I, we, I, you know, he started doing contract consulting work for me. I hired uh, some hardware guys to as consultants. And I said, we've got to become digitally capable. So we spent a couple of years building things to the point where we get a microprocessor that would run on a battery. And then eventually, um, and that patent, we did patent that. It issued a physicist, another physicist from Hungary, who I'd known because I'd worked on MIDI gear for him with um, mm. John McLaughlin's guitar. He came to me, he said, look, I'm working with a Kai professional. Uh, I, I'm working on a system, but I think I've run into a patent problem with your patent. Would you care to talk to us? Oh. I said, fine, we'll talk. So what happened was we had our algorithm working but they had the hardware working. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I licensed the, the hardware platform from Akai. Four months later, Akai went out of business, and Andras uh, called me and said, look, uh, they, well, they, they, they sold the business to um, M Music. Andras said, they, they don't really understand me at M Music. Do you have anything for me? He's been working for me ever since, 20 years. So between the guys that we have in-house, and I have two really strong digital signal processing guys in-house, really strong, and the guys in Hungary, and um, we developed a, a team, there's three of them in Hungary that do firmware, embedded, embedded programming, all the way down to uh, machine language, mm -hmm. and we have algorithm development at Fishman, and it just kind of rolled from there, mm -hmm. and R became a reality. Wow, I'm going to show on the screen the first Aura. This is from Sound on Sound back in, uh, when was this article written? I couldn't find the MIDI pick. This is... Oh, that never went to market. Okay, that sounds interesting. I mean, the world now is so into MIDI gear, that actually sounds like something that could be an interesting concept. Um, the problem was you couldn't do it wirelessly right, at that time. You right. have a bracelet and, then, you know, it's just... Yeah, no, I, I get it. This is November 2004. And this is right. the first system. I'm going to put it up on the screen for the viewers. This is the one that I actually had. When I lived in London, I had one of these. And honestly, I mean, I was new to gear. I was pretty new to, to gig and even. I didn't really understand it. But I had that first system that looked, you know, the before you made it into the, before you made it into this one. Sure. I had that one before. So, what, so what, why did you, why was it designed that way? And why did the design change? Well, that was actually the second one. The very first one was an onboard aura. Oh. It was a pre prefix premium onboard aura that we sold to Martin. And that was the very first aura product that was commercialized. Um, this uh, original one was the hardware that we had licensed from Akai Professional. And the board existed. They were actually using it as a vocal processor, of course, you know, like a TC Electronics thing and they didn't want to change the board so i had to design something around that board right and it had a certain number of controls and a numeric display and we came up with this wacky star wars type case for it it looked like a that one had midi as well midi in that's correct yeah. well that was we didn't use midi in to control anything uh you could control a few parameters but that's how we downloaded the images via oh. midi because that was pre-usb okay and uh there are a lot of great features in that one it was a little too complicated for most people though the fact that you could save patches eq the pickup and the image and the blend amount and the amount of compression and 
dial it all in, save it as a patch. We, we're pretty some pretty advanced features that really um, I'm sorry they're not in the spectrum. But you know, you give people gear that's complicated, and you limit your audience dramatically. Yeah. And we knew that we were having trouble uh, with the um, technical ability of a lot of acoustic guitar players at that time because they weren't in the things that keyboard people were into and stuff. And, and um, it was just too complicated a piece of gear. So uh, we, you know, we worked on several variations of that. We came out with the Spectrum. Uh, a lot of people didn't want to have to download things from libraries and this and that. They just wanted to plug in and pull up a sound. So the Spectrum comes loaded with a lot of things, but it's, it's kind of hit and miss because you've got to match a guitar pretty closely to it. And, you know, you can go to our library. There's thousands of images up there. A lot of people don't bother. They just want to plug in and turn some dials. Yeah. And that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. A lot of people, so, a lot of people like that. So, so, I mean, this and, one's been around for quite a while, right? This is the, the latest generation yeah, that's one. Yeah, around for about five years, I think, five, six years, yeah. I'm guessing. Um, that's our, our latest generation. We had smaller pedals. The R16s, which didn't have all the controls, but mm. you could download from our library, and then it just had 16 images. So this guy's been around maybe even five or six years. I'm not sure. So two things I particularly like about this pedal is the compre the one knob compressor is awesome, and the yep. anti feedback works really well. Sure so, it does. Um, can you, actually, can you just talk about the compressor? What, what is it? I mean, I, a lot of my friends love this compressor, this one knob compressor. What does it do exactly, and why did you why did you develop it that way? Well, um, we listen to a lot of compressors. I don't think acoustic guitars really should have a lot of compression on them because people buy that or play acoustics because of the dynamic range. Mm, I agree. But uh, it can help use uh, the right amounts, and it's got to be the right uh, – uh, it's got to be the right curve and the best sounding compressors that we found were the old single knob over, over easy, the DBX over easy compressors. So that's what that was modeled after. It just works. You don't have to be a genius. People have trouble that people that don't spend time in studios and recording stuff. People have trouble with parametric equalizers. Yeah. Gee, they can't do, compressors are even more problematic yeah, yeah. if you're not really comfortable. So, we designed that and um, works pretty well. I agree. I'm not a big fan of compression in general, but I always thought that compressor worked well. And actually, my friend Chris is here from Brooklyn, and he he's always dialing in compressors for acoustic as well. He plays differently. He does a lot of soloing and stuff. He wants compression. Sure. But I'm not really a fan of it in general, but he likes it, and he's always said to me he loves that one knob compressor, and he wishes it was in like a small, pe like just an individual pedal or something because it oh, works so it, well. Um, that's a good idea. We are yeah. actually coming out with a series of individual pedals, mini oh, size, right, right. Um, that we were going to release at the NAMM show this mm -hmm. year, but I don't know if there's going to be a NAMM show, right. but there are mini AFX pedals, and there's about eight in the series, mm -hmm. and one of them is a compressor, by the way. Is so. there an anti-feedback one? Yes. Awesome. I love that. That yeah. is great. Because, that again, you know, you can go and you can dial it out, but I, I love the way you just hold down the button that sucks it out. Um, that is such a useful feature. I wish all PA systems had that built in because it's so. Sure. You, when you're on a when you're on a gig and you're running around, if you just hit a button and it does that, awesome. So that brings me on to one of my favorite ever systems, which was the F1 system in the retro guitars. And that's how right. I met Martin. I went to them to talk to him about that system and that guitar. They told me they were discontinuing the retro oh, guitar oh. and they were moving the system. So. How did how did that? I mean, that was a. I think that again was so ahead of its time. When you, the controls and that preamp, it did it, it basically. For everyone who doesn't know, it did everything this does in your guitar. It Which, did more actually. More it than allowed, that. allowed you to get separate e EQ on um, the mic and the pickup. Well, this one does that too, right? No, it, that's either global or pickup. Oh, only. I didn't know that. Okay. Depending on which button you hold. Right. Okay. okay. Wow. Yeah, amazing. So, so when you think about it. That system yeah. has all the features that the very original uh, Aura okay. had, the, the Starship type one. Okay. Yeah. So I that system. Look, <laughs> as I might have mentioned before, I'm I'm not sure. Maybe it's another convers conversation. 
we make a lot of things and we have a significant OEM presence in the industry. And a lot of what we do is driven by our customers' requests. We're not shoving stuff down their throat. We did the Martin system um, because I thought that was the best we could possibly come up with in a diminished of uh, control format, you know, a couple of small knobs and a, a little window. Um, Chris Martin actually started the um, uh, notion of um, the retro series. He said, gee, Larry, you make the guitars sound great, but can you make them sound like the ones in my museum? Uh, in my um, museum? Mm. I said, well, Chris, you might remember a conversation when I first came out with Aura. You said, gee, this could put me out of business if you sell it to other people and they can make their guitars sound like mine. And I said, Chris, I promise you, I will never do that. Or it will be an enhancement for the guitar that you have. Mm. So if Gibson buys it, they can't make it sound like a Gibson and a Martin and so forth. That made sense. And technically, it's you, got, you have to have almost a perfect match uh, in doing what we pulled off with the retro. Mm. But the retros were guitars that were made to the pre-war specifications, bracing-wise and so forth. And really, they just had faster necks, but everything else was pretty much the same as pre-war. So the stiffness of the top, the way they were braced, all of that, um, uh, the construction details were as close as you could get. So I said, yeah, I said, Chris, I think I can do this. I'm not sure. Uh, I knew I needed to have multiple convolutions and deconvolutions to take the essence of the um, the uh, museum guitars and get it into the new pr production guitars. Um, and I worked on it for a while. I was pretty convinced I could do it. And then we kicked off the project. They loaded up millions of dollars worth of museum guitars, drove them down to Nashville. Wow. We went into my dear friend, Bill Vorndick's studio. Do you know Bill at all? No, I don't. Bill's multi-Grammy producer, recording engineer, did all the Newgrass Revival stuff, Bela Fleck stuff, Jerry Douglas, um, all the Nashville singer, songwriters. Bill is an astonishing um, acoustic uh, recording engineer. He also probably has the most extensive microphone collection I've ever seen in my life, because mm. when the Nashville studios got in trouble years ago and started Going out of business, Bill's buying everything to get his hands on, and there are lots of old ribbon mics and vintage everything. And he also knows more about miking techniques. He taught me everything I know about miking an acoustic guitar, wow. and it's stuff that never would have occurred to me otherwise. So we took those guitars down there. We spent four days recording the uh, museum guitars and recording the production models. Uh, we're sending files back to my head of R&D <laughs> via the internet, and he's doing these multiple convolution transforms, sending them back down. We're auditioning them. It was a great process, and the Martin guys were there, and we were there, and pop, there it goes. And I thought those guitars were incredible. I love that retro series. was amazing. But the only problem for me is, like you said earlier, trends change, and I started to want the body sound. For me, yes. for me, that was the only thing that was missing. Like, I didn't have the body mm -hmm. sound there, which you, you then brought in with the next system, the um, or the VT in, in hand, um, Enhance. But you're absolutely right. Um, but one, one thing, I just need to take a pause for a second. Our, our chat room has gone up in numbers. We've got lots of questions. I feel like I'm kind of halfway through. Are you okay for time? Or are you on a time limit? No, I'm good. Okay. Um, I have nowhere you... to work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to ask you, obviously you're a busy man, but... Um, I knew this. I should have. I should have warned you because when you when I talked to you about pickups, I could talk about it for hours. So, you know, I feel like we're kind of halfway through. And um, so, so, so a question that people, you know, the whole. I mean, let's face it. We could do an hour just on IR technology. But one question that comes up a lot, especially now, there's more interest in it, is do you? Because with the with this system, you, you were saying, okay, you have the same pickup we used. You have the matrix, and you choose the um, image that closely matches your guitar. Okay, Correct. so a lot of people now are buying helixes and things and loading in their own impulse responses, and they do make things sound better, but sometimes they can sound weird. So, do you have to use? Do you have to use an image 
and the pick, pick up in that guitar to get the best results? Because then with a retro, you're saying you use different guitars. Is that a different yeah, process then? It is a different process, and I had to make special pickups for those guitars because they were glued in saddles. Right. And we, had, we had to do a lot of stuff. Okay, so the first thing we had to do is make the pickups that we made for those guitars sound like the pickups, like the Matrix pickup. And that was a whole set of convolutions in themselves. And I hate to use the word IR. I think it's misleading. Mm. People will throw it around now. That's what it is. There's so much more here than a strict bang impulse response where you're popping a gun or, mm. you know, popping a balloon and getting a reflective response in the room. Uh, and that's why, coincidentally, when we came out with uh, the first Aura, uh, we called it acoustic imaging. Right. And we got so much crap from people, no, no, you're modeling, you're modeling. I'm saying, we're not modeling, we're imaging. And I think there was a major distinction there. What, first off, we didn't want people to think that it was the same thing as a Line 6 pod, which mm -hmm. is modeling. Yeah. And we, we weren't doing that. We were taking the image of real things that really are, exist in, in the world, in the instrument, the, the pickup, the microphone, the whole system, okay? With a pod, the input device is anonymous because the pod is modeling the response of a preamp or a power amp section and a lot of that stuff. Mm. But it's going to do whatever it does, no matter what guitar you plug into it. So the, the source of what you're playing is totally anonymous. Yeah. Not the case with acoustic instruments. The instrument itself has so much personality and um, the way it radiates and so forth. You can't ignore the instrument. Yeah, by any means. Now the pickup is an important part of of an acoustic image because pickups respond differently in phase response and um, frequency response and so forth. I'm not saying one's better than the other. As long as you can put a linear signal into your image creation, you're going to be fine. You can do it with a, a um, soundboard transducer that, as long as it's mounted close to the bridge plate. You do it most successfully with um, under saddle pickups. You can't do it very well or at all with a magnetic pickup because that's a nonlinear responding system because of its location. When you fret the instrument, that pickup is virtually moving in relationship to the proportion from of the position of the bridge to where you're fretting. Open, it's here. You fret it up high, it it, it moves. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the reason I call it impulse response is because I feel like now, again, with the Helix and these kind of pedals where everyone's now, because now people are loading in cab impulse responses, I feel like now the market is more used to those terms, and I feel like it's more complementary to Aura because I think, again, yeah, in the beginning, people thought it was digital and fake and modeled and like you were saying. Sure. I think impulse response, I think I, think, I just say that I, I think it's a compliment. It's a good way of thinking about it for people, just because they're familiar with what that is now from other products. But, sure. I, but I get what you're well, saying. I get what you're saying. I'm just, yeah, yeah. That, that's my thoughts behind it. Well, an impulse response in, th these are linear impulse responses mm. that you load into helixes and so forth, okay? They just happen to be the same type of filters that most people are using in their acoustic stuff. They're finite impulse response filters, okay? Yeah. But some systems are going to be a little more complicated than that. They're going to have IIRs in the lower end right. and FIRs for the upper end. Those, those won't work mm. in a standard IR load. Also, IR loading, a lot of the systems have length requirements, mm. how many taps. Yeah. And I'm not sure what's going on in the Helix, but you have to be really, really careful with an acoustic transform FIR, because if you have too many taps, you start getting a reverb effect yeah. on the top end. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it, 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 it's not a classical impulse response. It involves a lot of the same techniques. But when you do electronic impulse responding, you sweep it, or you send a impulse function through, and it measures the response of the system. You can't sweep an acoustic guitar, mm. and you can't bang it with a quick impulse, and the manner in which you play 
and mic the guitar are critical to what the response is going to be on the other end. So it's an impulse response plus you got to do something else with the impulse. Yeah. Besides just giving an impulse. <laughs> no, I agree. I'm, I'm not. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to belittle it by calling it impulse. I just. I'm trying to help people understand what it is. I remember I saw Tommy Emmanuel at a workshop once, and he said, um, "I use my maintenance system because it's a mic and under saddle. Like those digital ones, they sound fake. They sound digital." I think right. that's that's just that's just something that gets in people's head. I've, one, one of your articles <laughs> on Premier Guitar is about digital versus analog, and I see it now every day on the forums. You know, and I've done it myself. I've gone from a Kemper to a real amp to a Helix to a real amp, and this, a lot of it is in your head. And like, I want that thing, and yeah, it, it's 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 a, it's that's a whole that's a whole other story. But it it is a whole story. <laughs> in conclusion, yeah, you could call what we do an impulse response. Uh, you'll probably be able to load impulse responses in our next R system. Mm. We'll open it up, okay. but. Um, there's a lot more going on there than just something that you would get by sweeping up a preamp and getting its response. If you if you would if you were going to open up the next one to to load your impulse responses in, would you also allow the user to take them out, like to take yours and put them into their other products? It's kind of undetermined right now. We do some stuff with ours that won't load into a regular IR loader. Mm. We do some optimization that. Uh, we have to spend, we haven't seriously considered that, so I don't know how successful it will be or not, okay? Mm. We have a closed system right now. Yeah. If we open it up and it and those images can work with a Helix or something, of course we will. But I'm not sure we're going to be successful. But I just don't know yet. I guess the problem then is I could take those and share them around and then you would lose sales of the pedal. That's the. Nah, I mean the fact that we provide a, yeah, I mean that's that's part of the issue. You know, we do have to make a living. Yeah. This stuff's expensive to develop and yeah. so forth. Um, but you know, I people have have taken our our images. They figured out how to get them already. Yeah. It yeah. kind of pisses me off, but you know, they're showing up in libraries that go into Axe Effects and stuff like that. And, mm. And I go, well, this kind of sucks. But <laughs> It would be nice if there was a way that I could own the pedal and pay you to have that in my Helix, but, you know, so you still get your money and it's not shareable. Something like that would be a great thing in the future. Because, that would. You know. That would. So, one of my favorite systems, the Aura VT Enhance. Absolutely mm -hmm. love that system. I, I, I personally felt the low end... There was, there was something about it that wasn't quite perfect for me, but as an all-round system with the body tapping, the fact you could bring the body tapping in and take it out again, absolutely mm -hmm. incredible. I mean, this is that this is this version of Aura, of course, not Aura HD, which I just reviewed. We'll get we'll get to that, but um, <clears throat> I love that system. And now, once again, I kind of I think it still is in some guitars, but I feel like okay. Here's here's what I was hoping. I was hoping we'd see uh, Aura VT Enhance HD with maybe an app to give those controls back that the F1 had. That was what I was kind of hoping. That's the direction I hope was hoping Martin would go in. Right. But they didn't. They've kind of gone back to simple again. But now here's the thing. I've got to tell you. Did you see the interview with Chris Martin? Yes. So I know, I know I've mentioned this to you before, and you've, said, you've answered this question. But for the viewers, he said to me he thinks the future is in apps for the phone to control the, the preamp. So, what do you, do you have? You have you any new thoughts about that? Well, I have new thoughts and old thoughts. Chris has been asking me to do stuff with the phone for a long time. Mm. Um, you know, the the thing that makes me hesitant is the fact that people say, "Gee, I don't want to buy a, a um, I don't want to buy a guitar with an electronic system in it because the guitar is going to last a long, long time, and the electronics." might be outdated in 10 years and how can I do this and so forth. I'm afraid unless it's done and I haven't really brought this to ground yet as far as thinking it out, but I don't want to put something in a guitar that won't work because Apple's changed their format in four years. Right. You're stuck then with something you can't control unless you have an old phone. Right. 
And we've had issues with that already with our MIDI systems and Apple suddenly changing a lot of, a lot of things in their OS yeah. and in their iOS system yeah. that we had to completely rewrite and issue new firmware to everything yeah. to get it to work on platforms that did work. And I can't support, I said, Chris, if you want to set up so you can support your customers 10 years down the road, mm. I'll do something. But I don't want to be getting calls from a, a thousand uh, Martin customers 10 years from now saying <laughs> my phone's not talking to my guitar yeah, right now. Yeah. I have a thought. Yeah. I have a thought on it, if you don't mind me sharing it. Sure. Okay. So um, I have a mixer that uses a web app interface. Yep. And I, I, yeah. I thought this, okay, so maybe you could, maybe you could connect with a, well, I guess it'd be wireless and an app or something, but for that problem of the app becoming outdated, maybe it could have like a reset button that put it to factory because the Aura, the Aura Enhance was a great all-in-one system. So that with Aura HD just by itself could be for the, the regular user. But for the people like me that want to turn up the bass or turn up the blend or something like that, you know, the, the, amount, of Im the amount of image, maybe you could have something where there's like a, a recessed, a hidden reset button where it puts it back to stock, which is fine. That's what the current system is. But if you plug it in with a cable to your computer, you can tweak it or Bluetooth, you can tweak it via a web app or something like that. I don't know. I, d I just love the idea of combining that, that Aura F1 system, those features and more features with that VT Enhanced Aura with Aura HD. I just think that for me would be the ultimate system. That's just a personal thing I want to put out there because I, uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? Stand by. Okay. Okay. Please, okay. okay, please do that for me. Thank you. All right. And for Chris. <laughs> yeah, you know, Chris loves stuff. Yeah. Little, and, but he uses a Blackberry still, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, something. yeah, yeah. It was, um, no, I, I don't want to say that. Okay, okay. Um, I had to get him onto, onto Chris, Skype. Chris is I, enamored with that type of stuff. I get it, right? He's yeah. got a guitar in the museum with an iPhone stuck in the side. Do you know that? No. Yeah, it was years ago. He doesn't seem to care about technology. When I asked him about the or, the Aura and the, the new bags and, and the Tone Dexter, he just made a funny face if you saw that in the video. <laughs> it's like... I didn't he, know what that was. He, he, yeah. he gets it, but he doesn't want to... He doesn't want to understand it, but I think he gets the importance of the technology. Let me comment, because we have a hugely... Uh, a wonderful relationship with the guys at Martin, and Chris has been a friend for years and years and years. Chris has a vision for how he wants to run the company. And Chris um, uh, Chris is a smart guy, but he likes to, he's a butterfly on certain things. He gets really interested in different things. Right. And I think Chris's company is successful enough that uh, just selling Martin guitars, that this is an area that he kind of lets multiple people, people in the company decide on things depending upon who's in what seat at what month he gets input from these. It's very much unlike Taylor, where Taylor, I mean, we did business with Taylor for t 10 years. We sold them every single system that was in their guitar. They're all the barn doors. <laughs> Taylor takes a very different approach. They designed a system. It's in all of their guitars. They're as consistent as they can be about marketing, mm. their marketing message. And that works for them. Chris is in a, in a much more freeform form position with where guitars are going at Martin with the exception of the traditional stuff. He will not let that slide whatsoever, but the other stuff he likes to play. He does the CEO models every year. I mean, it's, he's having fun man. he's running an yeah. incredibly successful company. And, um, and he, and it's at Martin, there's a million people deciding what products right. should look like and should be. And we're there to work closely with them as a business partner and provide what they want. I, I wish that they would let things sit a little longer sometimes, mm. uh, but they've had a lot of turnover in sales and this and that, and people come in with new ideas, and that's just business. That's nothing yeah. wrong with what they're doing. They're, they're quite successful. I totally get that. I totally get they're a business. They're incredibly successful. They have a vision. I do get confused sometimes with what they're doing because I remember three years ago, Chris Martin said at a Q&A, I think the, the next big thing will be with your pickups. And that's, that, that, when he said that, I thought we were going to see the following year the system I just talked about. And we, sure. and we haven't. And he doesn't seem that, that into technology, but he does, he does 
you know, personally, but he does seem to want it in his guitars. Again, with the F1, or F1 system that was so ahead of its time. Um, but well, let me put it like this. If Tim Teal, the head guitar designer, yeah. had his choice, there'd be F1 and everything. Right. Absolutely right. everything. Okay. And Tim loves technology. And he's always calling me up, oh, I got the new Helix and the this. Oh, really? And, you know, oh, yeah. Maybe I should speak, he, speak to him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's Tim. Yeah. And then you have other people that are far more conservative. And, you know, it's... it's um, what can I say? It, they're a great co customer and partner, and yeah. they're running their business quite successfully doing what they're doing. Yeah. But a lot of what we bring to market is driven by the requests of our OEM customers. Right. There's no one size fits all anymore. In fact, that was one of the reasons we lost the business with Taylor. We we're so successful in OEM with the onboard blenders that I'll never forget there was a Guitar Player magazine review of like four high-end guitars with the identical system in it, hmm. and it really pissed off Bob. He said, gee, I can't be there. I'm the best. Oh. I need to be different. Wow. Yeah, actually, Bob Taylor is someone I would love to speak to. My first Fishman was in a Taylor acoustic guitar, and then, of course, they went okay. they went off and made their own system. Um, okay. Let's talk about Aura HD then. So I've not heard much about it. Maury's Music sent me one to review. Did you see the review of that guitar I did? I did. Thanks. Very complimentary. That was not a lie, and I can't wait to tell you today. This is what this is exactly what happened. I, I did my recordings. I sat here mixing the video, and I thought it's not ma it's, oh, it's matching up or something's not quite right. I went back and listened to the recordings. I had mixed up the direct pickup with the <laughs> microphone. Right. I'm not just saying that to to you know to get in your good books. That's tr I couldn't believe it. That's never yeah. happened to me before. I was really blown away, and I was like, "Yep, yeah, this they're they're on a good path with this new thing, and I can't wait to see where it goes." So that's Aura HD, right? Yeah, um, that's the the only example in the world today. It's in that guitar. There will be aftermarket products with it, um, and um, I just don't know where things are going at the moment. Aaron, business is such a mm. um, black hole. Yeah, that we have actually um, stopped a lot of our development work mm -hmm. and brought the day we go back to work we're taking our entire engineering team and putting them into production uh -huh. because i have huge backlog on fluence pickups which we make in the u.s yeah. and that's going to sustain us until we understand what's going on in the business so all our development projects are going to be delayed while we make stuff that we can actually sell right now mm -hmm. that's our, is on order so we have some great aura products in the pipeline mm. great there are multiple multiple ones at all different platforms and levels and so forth and uh hd will be the shining star mm. that kind of holds them all together can you just tell the viewers briefly like what is the difference then between the, the aura and the aura hd how would you explain that uh they're fundamentally you know trying to do the same thing but since we have close to 20 years experience with creating images um, and uh, we've always recognized issues, problems, and we figured out how to fix them in recording techniques and stuff like that. And there's still some head scratchers. Gee, we did everything the same on this guitar. And then when we do it on a, another guitar, mics in the same position, guitars. We don't get a good image. It's it's it's, it's messy. Okay, mm -hmm. so we finally went in there and figured out through some deep, deep, deep pulling apart of thousands of images. Okay, these sound great. These sound bad. We figured out why. Okay, and the new or uh, or um, convolution process took everything we learned from all those imaging sessions in a very organized way and created a much more stable convolution. We also learned a lot about recording techniques that uh, dramatically uh, affect the way the image comes out. Um, you just have to not ignore things of that nature by any means. And we've also um, gone to a um, more precise filter set as far as uh, um, frequency, um, frequency matching and things of that nature. So there's been, you know, three or four things yeah. that make it work. And what that translates to from trying, I mean, there's not been many reviews of it yet, so I'm, I'm really glad I got to try it, but 
Um, you can basically run it at full 100%. Still sounds really good. The high end is really nice now. The high end is yep. very very clear. So, so it's cutting and you can record with it. Again, it sounded very close to my mic. My, 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 my mic isn't the same as the mic you used in that guitar. I'm, I'm, te I'm tempted to ask you what mic was used on the D18, but you might not remember. You know, I'd have to look yeah, it up. Yeah, but mine's, mine's obviously diff well, most likely different, but it just sounded so good. And um, sure. I think you. I think I think that's, that's. I can't wait to see that. I mean, again, this year we've got um, we've already got Tone Dexter. We've got the sounds, the bags one coming soon. So sure. that's why I'm saying like IR type stuff is definitely yep. Yep. coming into the future now. So I'm glad you guys are working with Aura. It's awesome news. Um, we should also just touch on this guitar as well. Okay. <laughs> can you just tell? Uh, can you just tell us? I mean, that's that's a, that's a whole another episode. But can you just give us like the the short version of like how Fender came to you and, and so is and is this Aura or is this different to Aura? That's the Acoustasonic, by the way, in case someone doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, the story is uh, we supplied Fender with all of their acoustic guitar electronics for 15, 20 years now. Okay. If you buy a Fender acoustic, it's got a fishing system in it. Okay. So I already had a good relationship with Fender. Um, and um, Tim Shaw, who's one of the designers of the guitar itself, uh, goes back 30 years with me. He used to work for me before he worked really? for Fender. Wow. Yeah, he was at Gibson for years and years and years. Henry fired him one day for no reason. I hired Tim the next day. Oh. <laughs> Tim worked for me for several years. He got us very involved in the Asian supply chain that we are very active in. We went to Korea and Japan and set up our way of feeding the OEM factories there because Tim had spent a ton of time doing um, Asian travel. And then um, when Fender opened a custom shop in Nashville, uh, I was trying to talk Tim into working, moving to Boston, but his wife had family in Nashville, her mother, this and that. And then he called me and said, Larry, Fender's wants me to run their custom shop. I said, well, that's perfect. You better take it. Yeah. We've been friends ever since. We worked on a lot of Fender projects. And Brian Schwartfeger, I don't know if you know who Brian is. I met him at Brian, NAM, yeah. Or I saw him at NAM. Yeah, Brian's really very interesting guy. Great guitar player. Grew up playing in bands at Disneyland. Hmm. Got personal tour of the Fender factory from Leo Fender himself. Wow. Uh, was working at Line 6 when they came out with the pod. I didn't know that. Fascinating. Yes. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. And eventually ended up at Taylor. And, um, <laughs> oh, the T5, was, right? The T5. Well, before that, he was doing marketing um, and sales at Taylor. Mm. And uh, he did the T5 with Dave, David Hostler. Wow. They did the T5. So that's Brian's background. Brian left Taylor after about 10 years or so and was hired by Fender as a consultant to look at designing new Fender acoustics. And he did their new Fender acoustics with the Fender headstocks, mm -hmm. the, you know, the Malibu and the, you know, all the, those guitars. Yeah. And, then, and he came out several times and I hadn't known Brian for years, but we got pretty close on those visits. He, we got some really good work done on those guitars. And he said, look, Tim and I have been working on a project that, um, excuse me, I knew it might happen. <laughs> Let me shut it down. So, um, where was it? And he said, look, Tim and I are work working on this platform. Mm. And he said, I think you're the only guy in the world that's going to be able to pull this off for us. What do you think? I said, well, what do you have in mind? He said, I want this, 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 and this, and you got to do it all with two knobs and a five-way switch. And I said, you're nuts. <laughs> you're crazy. He said, you want to give it a try? I think this could be really good. And I got it. I said, send me the guitar. Let's see what's going on. Pretty impressed with the guitar showed up. I said, is this just a winger or do you have marketing support for this? Cause there's going to be a lot of work here. A lot of work. He said, no, Andy, the CEO is convinced we need to get a new platform. He's going to be behind this. If we can pull it off, he's going to put a million dollars on the marketing launch. 
yada da da da. And I said, okay, I'm game. And we dove in, and um, twelve weeks later, voila. Yeah. And what we did there, we did a lot. Okay, we built a analog model of a deluxe front end in there, the tone stacks. That's all done in analog because I didn't want to handle electric guitars digitally for a lot of reasons. So we did analog front end there. We did, and it, it this is not, this is, takes a lot of what we learned with R, but there's a lot of sound crafting in there because in part of our analysis for HD, we really got to see what makes a, a D18 sound different than an OM uh series or a, a tailor or whatever you know talk about stiffness and resonant points and that so there's a we use known guitar types as our um as our basis and this is more of the modeling venue than anything we've done before but the platform is perfect for it because it has so such little acoustic activity on stage that it's not fighting the model right it's not trying to impose itself on the model i see so we did a lot of imaging type of work that we took and created models that we knew sounded like types of guitars. There's no specific guitar we use. We just said, okay, this group of guitars sounds like a small body maple. I mean, these resonances and so forth. Let's go with this. And we built complementary images. Uh, they wanted a, a another function besides the magnetic pickup. We put the tap sensor in there uh, that you can blend with the uh, images. And then the electric side was actually the hardest. He said, "Look, the electric side has to go from semi clean to clean, uh, semi clean to Keith Richards going through a Fender Deluxe, and it has to work through a PA or a full range system." Mm -hmm. And I said, "That's going to be tough." So we built cab models there. We've got all kinds of digital stuff happening on the electric side to make it sound like it's coming through an electric guitar. Amp. So is the electric, is that an analog pickup, but with like a cab sim, so you can plug it straight into a PA system? Is that how it works? Yes, it is. Okay, so if you wanted to plug well, it into a Helix though, would you then, can you, because if you plug into a Helix and then add a distortion pedal, you'll still need a cab after the distortion pedal, right? It's become sort of, the design criteria was, this is for singer songwriters and you know, people that want to have an electric sound, but they're primarily an acoustic player. Mm. And we we argued about whether to put a cab defeat switch on there or not. Mm. Okay. And Brian said, no, mm. it's got to be a Fender guitar. It's got to be a five-way switch and a couple of knobs. So no, there's no talk about app control or editors for this project, project then? Nothing. It's got to be dirt simple, and you got to be able to make great sounds on it without an, without a manual. I've actually so, I've actually messaged Brian on Facebook to see if he'd come on. He didn't reply. So if you ever speak with him, then maybe uh, put a word in for me. <laughs> he'd be a great guy. I know. I want. I want because because you know, I've been working with Fender to promote that guitar. So I'd love to have him to talk just about that guitar. It'd be a really interesting conversation. The interesting thing is, it was designed to play through an acoustic guitar amp or a PA. Mm. People are playing it through through deluxes and twins and things of that nature and and. Uh, the double cab model doesn't seem to be upsetting. Yeah, yeah. I've heard people play it online through a through a, a Fender amp, and it sounds awesome. It sounds great. Yeah. I guess you've just got to, again, it's like everything else. You've got to dial it in, and you've got to make it sound good, right? So, but yeah, it's exactly. Good. So I, I think that was just fortunate. We did mm -hmm. we did all the development with uh, a Loudbox Performer. It's our highest powered acoustic guitar amp, and then at the end, the, the real nail biter was. All right, let's plug this into a deluxe and see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Working. And it worked. Yeah. I mean, your acoustic amps, I have to say, I don't own one, but they do sound very good. I have a story where I was in Nashville and I was trying some systems and I just thought they all sounded incredible. And I got home and plugged it into my QSC. My QSC is great, but sure. it didn't sound, and I do have some other acoustic amps now, but it didn't sound um, as good. And I feel like your acoustic amps are very complementary to acoustic guitars, the way they're I've heard other people say that as well, like, I think you told me it's because you don't use a horn. Is that right? Is that what you said? Or is is there some kind of voicing that you do to your acoustic amps that makes them sound very rich with the acoustic guitars? Well, it, it, our, one criteria that we always had when we designed acoustic guitar amp is it's got to sound great when you're singing through it. Yes, that's hard to do. 
not pushing the whole thing. And we couldn't get there without using a, 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 a dome tweeter. That turned it on, okay? And we said, okay, we're going to go here. Horns do certain things. They're louder. They're this and that, but they're harsher. And, you know, it's, it, it depends on how much you're throwing into the room and how you want to do it. That's just our approach. You know, they're flat responding electronics. There's no extra voicing suck outs or anything. When those knobs are flat and you sweep the amp, it's incredibly flat. Wow. It's more like a studio monitor than it is a PA. Mm. So people could use those with electric modelers as well, right? They sound great with electric oh, That's models. good to know. Okay. All right, we've had so many questions in here. I think we should go through some questions and comments because people have been good enough to sit here and, uh, and join in. That would be great. Uh, so let me just, let me just, I'm going to scan through and I'm going to pick some out. This has been very interesting though. Thank you so much. Well, of course I'm in my element, my element right now, because um, this is what I love to talk about, but okay. We should talk about the electric pickups. Are you surprised by the success and overall acceptance of the Fishman Fluence? Yeah, I'm pretty surprised uh, from just a market acceptance business point of view, because Guitar players are reticent to change, or they they do accept things, but slowly. Uh, ba bass players are much more aggressive about new, new technology in their instruments than guitar players traditionally are. Um, the whole or um, the whole experience with uh, Fluence has been um, a real ride for us. It started with an idea was well, what the hell? Let's see what we can do here. Uh, we don't, you know, we've been in the um, acoustic instrument pickup business for, you know, 40 years. And everyone kept saying, well, why don't you do electric guitar pickups? And I said, why? Steve Blucher and Larry DiMarzio are doing a great job there. Uh, Seymour really knows his stuff. He's good. EMG's great. You know, we wouldn't have any business being in that business unless we had something very different to bring to the party. And um, those guys have been at it forever. They're all smart. And we just didn't, at least I don't, at my age, have the time to go through a 30-year trial and error, figure it out system like Seymour did. Mm -hmm. So I said, no, we're not doing that. We'll just go in. We'll be taking market share, pissing everybody off, and not bringing anything to the party that's any different. And I knew that there are real issues with winding pickups because we do wind sound hole pickups for acoustic guitars and the variation was has always driven us crazy you know we're very careful and we got good winders and lots of issues there i said well look i stumbled into the uh, basic solid coil concept it's not my concept it was uh, developed by an aerospace company in upstate new york and the engineer there thought that okay, this coil is a stack solid coil. Who uses coils? And one day he said, well, maybe you can make a guitar pickup out of this. And they had no idea. And he made some really crude stuff that was terrible. But um, I looked at it and I was so intrigued with the mechanical nature of it. And all, you know, all of a sudden, all these light bulbs started going off. Gee, consistency, um, uh, and, and solid uh, no squealing, uh, all, all the things that we thought it would bring to the table. So I said, look, I think we could probably do something with this. I had to write a check to them to get a six month exclusivity, no shop deal on it. Cause they wanted to license it to me, the, uh, basic coil technology. And I said, look, I'll pay you this. Give me six months to see if I can turn it into guitar pickups. And we did so much more than just turn it into a pickup over that time. It was incredible. We learned exactly. We learned about more about how a magnetic pickup works than I ever thought we would. And I'm not saying from the electron electrical side. There are two circuits in a magnetic pickup. There's the coil, or in our case, there's a stack of circuit boards with printed coils on it. There's the you know the uh, uh, RLC circuit, the redu uh, resistance, inductance, capacitance. That forms a filter, automatically forms a second order um, low pass filter, and that's pretty basic stuff. You know, anybody that's taken basic electronics can figure that out. 
But there's also another circuit in there, and it's the magnetic circuit. And that one is, the, that's the tough one. Because you can't see it, you can't measure it on an oscilloscope. And I said, well, we can get the, the electronic side of it, or the filter side of it, and the sound side of it, but we can't get the dynamic characteristics right until we learn about magnetics. And my head of R&D, a brilliant, brilliant guy, who's been with me about 15 years, was trying to sh model, trying to measure and do finite element analysis and all this stuff. And um, he was, I was driving him crazy. I said, Alnico 2, Alnico 5, they sound different. Ceramic, you know, he said, he's driving him nuts. And he's not the type of guy that listens to, well, this is crunchier than this and that. I went on vacation. I came back, I, and we had some coils come in because we, we ordered a big batch from first batch. We had to order a 1,000 of them to get them made up. And they came in. I said, how are the coils? He said, they're measuring amazing as far as consistency. I said, how are they sounding? So, well, we haven't built any yet. I've been busy working on this machine. That's what he's talking about. He built a three-dimensional magnetic field um, um, graphical scanner. So, all of a sudden... The world of what's going on with different types of magnets, sandcast magnets versus non-sandcast, staggered pole, all, we could see it. We could see it on a screen. We could see what happens if you move the screws in a little different direction and how the field spreads and how it focuses. So at that point, I said, we got something here. We really do. We're going to have a lot of control. And then at the end of the day struggling with going active or not and i said you know what active is kiss of death except for certain areas around here got to be really careful i said the only there are a million reasons to go active that are too beneficial to ignore people have been making pickups the same way for 80 years you don't build houses with hammers anymore you use nail guns right airplanes have radar things happen I said, we're going, we're going to go with an active pickup because it brings so much to the party as far as being able to control everything and voice everything. And I said, but before we do that, we've got to come up with the proper battery um, management system because people can't put batteries in strats. And people, you know, we can't come up with active systems, put them in traditional guitars and tell people, well, you go figure that out. So the development of the power packs, the rechargeable power packs that um, non-invasively uh, fit on guitars is a big part of it. And when we're building the circuitry to support all this, we realize, heck, we can mimic the sounds, the characteristics of some really great pickups, not only design new sounds, but we can make a PAF that sounds like a vintage PAF, that chimey, nice, almost Telecaster-type sound, but we can give it a little more output so it's more comfortable driving a modern amp. All those things that you get when you can go active and we said gee if we can do that we can do multiple voices that when you build the circuit not only can you split coils and do things of that nature but you can actually change and shape the tonal and dynamic characteristics of the pickups in the same pickup without having to add an extra preamp to your guitar and stuff so that's what we brought to the party it was truly uh a, a pickup that solves some problems yeah and we didn't we didn't invent new sounds we love the old sounds yeah we just made our version of them i, I tried them at nam for the first time and I, I really liked it and for me that's what well it comes down to does it sound good or, or not is good is it good or, I, I really liked it but i get it because i'm i'm quite traditional and i also like technology sometimes mm -hmm. sometimes i don't think they should cross over sometimes i think they do i think a lot of musicians are like that most people that have tried the acoustasonic guitars Defend the guitars, uh, impressed with them, but there's a lot of backlash on the internet about them, the price and the technology. And you know, whenever you try and do something new, you always see that online. That everything lights up and everyone's got an opinion on it. I, that must be a real challenge as well to do something new and be accepted for it. I get that. Well, that's why we were. When you asked me if I've been surprised by the success of, uh, of Fluence, uh, for all those reasons, I said, well. We might not be able to build a sizable business out of this, but it has exploded for us. And yeah. um, that's what we'll be doing when we get back to work is filling fluence back orders. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah so, I mean, you, you make so many products. It's, it's very impressive. Um, Chris Decker says, I can't wait to see those new pedals and um, 
Um, Jocko said, I'd like to hear more about those new pedals that were supposed to be released at them. So are those new, is that new line of pedals, are they, are they kind of developed or are they still in development? Uh, they are, I think there's eight of them and we've got like six of them finished. Hmm. And our hope was that we would um, release them in January or maybe release four, four of them and then a few months later release the rest. Hmm. We still have to get through manufacturing. And yeah. Manufacturing and supply chain is a total nightmare right now. You can't count on being able to get components. Of course. Yeah, of course. It's it's a mess. So they're coming. They're, they'll come as, as soon as we can get them out the door and have a proper launch for them. Are they like micro pedals or like? like yes. Okay, okay. I was going to say, why didn't you do like an all-in-one acoustic effects box type, type thing? But. We might at some point, but you know, uh, a lot of people have looked at the pedal market. People like, well, I like this compressor, but not that. And mm. you know, LRG, I wanted to make them affordable, and it, there's a million reasons to do either format, right? Yeah. I mean, we have a multi effects processor um, pedal, it's it's you know, our uh, tone, tone deck, yeah. And it's got, you know, it, it makes some people are thrilled with it. It's got plenty of stuff for them. Mm -hmm. But gee, that's great. But I wish it had a chorus that sounded like this. So. Yeah, I get that. It's hard to please everyone. Yeah. Um, Gary Roberts says he loves the Aura VT Enhance in the current Martins. Um, one thing is battery life. I noticed this. this. This is all relative. Like if you're playing every single night, then I had to change my battery every week. If you play out once sure. a month, it's not an issue. But um, do you think there's any... Now, do you think you'll be able to get a longer battery life from the IR, from the or oh, sorry aura type systems in the future? It depends on the microprocessor platform. Mm. Let's put it like this: when we came out with the first aura onboard aura, we squeezed twenty five hours of battery life out of it. Okay, the only other digital guitar preamp at that time was a um, Takamine preamp digital that Korg had designed. It was a programmable EQ. They got four hours. Mm -hmm. So we did a mammoth jump mm -hmm. there. We used um, the stingiest power consumption microprocessor that we can get to support the functions that are in there. So it depends where the technology goes. We're not in the microprocessor business. Mm -hmm. We have our microprocessor almost shut off to comp to keep it from, you know, using extra juice. It's doing a lot of work. And it should be getting around 25 hours of battery life out of it. Yeah, I mean, I get, we just we just always want more battery life. I guess I get it. I get it. You know, we could go rechargeable, mm. and um, if it's cost you're worried about, and, and like we did with Fluence. I think the rechargeable lithium ion battery is a huge benefit and you just plug your phone charger into it and there you go. But um, uh, we didn't because there was no convenient way to put a charging jack on that guitar and Martin didn't want to change the output module and so forth. But we may do that on future models. Um, you know, nine volt batteries are big ugly things. Mm -hmm. that flop around inside guitars you don't want to put a bigger battery in there than that mm -hmm. at least with the rechargeable it can be a permanent battery so it doesn't fall around inside the guitar and then you can recharge it yeah i, I never had that happen well one, one thing i love about your system is the way you can put the battery in either way around you're the only company i think that's done that really very clever well i know why we did it <laughs> <laughs> i get a phone call from the guys at martin and they said guitars are smoking. And there's smoke coming out of them. Oh man! And we had a battery box that you could put it in the wrong way. It, it wasn't secure enough to keep you from putting it in the wrong way. And um, there's a diode in there that blocks it when you design it that way. And the diode was getting so hot that the varnish on the diode was smoking. And I said, well, we can't do that anymore. <laughs> That's not good. So we came out up with a bridge design that allows us to put it in either way, and it figures it out. So. That's really I, – I, that's one of my favorite things because when you're on a gig and you've got to change the battery, you just pull that, pull that, throw one in, and you're good to go. Yep. It's a great, yep. a great idea. 
Um, Gary also says, why are, why are your noiseless electric pickups so much more musical than the others I've tried, including the big F company? Yeah, so what, why, are the noise, why, why are they so good at being noiseless, the electric um, fluence pickups? Because we have a set of tools available to us by the construction of the, these pickups that no one else has. Mm. And uh, we know what kills the high end on a noiseless pickup. And we can get beyond that. And they, and they can't. They're doing an amazing job of what they have. But they're not quite noiseless. And they're pretty dull sounding to me. So. Um, lots, of, lots of compliments on the Fishman customer service. Lots of people say oh, they've had a great, great experience with customer service. I well, appreciate that. Our guys work hard, and um, we love our customers. We want them to love us. You can't get it right 100% of the time. I wish you could. Um, but uh, if anyone has a problem with Fishman on the customer service side, direct a communication to me, a letter or something of that nature, or an email, and I'll find out what the problem is. We've always been that way, and we want to, we want to maintain – the best relationships with our customers because we, we're proud of our products. And when we sell you something, we want you to be happy with them. Yeah. And if there's something gone astray or awry or something, we are going to fix it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's important, isn't it? It's important to look after the customer and also to hear from them uh, what's happening with them as well. So, but, sure. but I, I love seeing you guys. I'm, I'm sad I won't see you at NAM this year because it's always great to see your um, Gary, mm. Gary and those guys. They're, they're, they're nice. Yeah. They're great people. They really are. Um, David says he has some old Parkers and the ribbon wiring deteriorates over time. Any suggestions on addressing this beyond replacing with another system? Hmm. <laughs> what model Parker is it? Just a regular fly? I don't know. Da David, if you're in the, if you're still here, put it in the, in the chat, what the model is, please. Um, Eric says, I may, oh, go ahead. I may have some supply of those. Hmm. Okay. Not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, that stuff. I don't know what's deteriorating. Whether it's the connector. I mean, that's good. Really good quality capped on film. They use that in fighter planes. That ribbon. It's not cheap ribbon. It should last. Um, if it's if they're ripping or something, that's one thing. But if they're just not working, I would say maybe clean the connector when it plugs into the connector or something with the antioxidizing material. Eric says, another incredible guest, and I agree. Thank you again. Um, what's the next step in making more natural sounding pickups? Is it simply better images? And, and that goes with a question I have. Like, what, what do you see after impulse response? Or a, is, is there anything else? Or is there another direction? Everyone's now going after impulse responses. Is there any, anything else that's been missed or that could be explored? Yeah, there's quite a bit, actually. That's interesting. I mean, I'm kind of sick of what impulse responses do because I've been living with them for a long time. And I, you know, I see the warts and the issues and this. And they're not a total panacea. They really aren't. They're really, they do some things really, really well. But um, there are deficiencies there and there are things that could be better. And uh, there are approaches that could, could be different. I mean, you see it when... It's kind of like guys that got Kempers or Axe Effects and this and that. Wow, we finally got it. You know, <laughs> it's there. You know, and then a year later, they're out buying the Friedman one. amps again or something. I mean, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Actually, it's been interesting what's happening here. I'm using the in ears for the interviews and, and to do yeah. my concerts on Saturdays. And I never liked in ears, but now I really, I'm used to them now. I like in ears. And for me, yeah. a Kemper or a Helix with the impulse response into these is great and it's like the recording and it's the same with impulse responses on acoustic but on right. stage i've always struggled with that because i like the real amp right and i like the analog pickup so it's that it's, it yeah. also depends how you play i agree it's not a total solution and they do well, again the in-ears the in -ears have changed the game somewhat because mm -hmm. of the feedback issues on stage if you don't have floor monitors you can get away with a lot richer bigger fatter thing you know, without worrying about feedback issues. I mean, I've seen it in the uh, bluegrass or new grass world and stuff like that, where these guys within here suddenly are getting rid of a lot of the issues they had. So you can use mics on stage mm. better 
you know, more more comfortably than you could before. But it, it's all kind of changing. I still don't see a huge number of people that are, other than touring pros using in-ears when they're gigging. I mean, mm-hmm. I know there's more than there used to be. But, I, I, you know, when I, I, don't, I haven't gone out to a club in the past month or so. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah. No, I've always, <laughs> I've always loved the real amp, the real PA speaker. But it's been interesting because I've been forced to use them yeah. Now I'm kind of actually actually quite quite like it. I mean, two months I've used them all the time. I'm actually I'm thinking maybe I'll try and use them in the venues. I don't know. We'll have to see how that goes. But well, you know, I, I used to use hearing protection, mm. and it was always disorienting for me. Yeah, I don't to, like that. I don't. Know, I don't like earplugs. Yeah. So I think in ears for me would probably have some of the same disorienting aspects. I like to hear when I'm playing on stage. I want to hear something coming right out of that piano or a drum kit or something because once it goes through a mic it all changes exactly when you're hearing the impulse response from like a Kemper it's different to hearing the amp in the room that's a huge thing that people are still debating there as well and it's, and it's just different it's, yeah it changes yeah so that's just the, the current wave that we're on um, I think it, it certainly depends on what type of music you're playing yeah. if you're playing prog rock or metal believe me the, the modeling stuff's great. Mm-hmm. None of those guys are using amps anymore. None of them. Right. There's amps on stage with the big empty boxes. Right. I mean, the big touring groups are just not using amps. They cut their cartridge costs down to a fraction. They have more reliability. You know, you go to a Devin Townsend gig, he's not using an amp, and he's got two computers taking care of it. And if one dies, the other one mm-hmm. is online and synced with it. It's And for heavy saturated music they seem to work quite well mm-hmm. and it's improving all the time yeah you know, yes so some i read someone said uh the original pod they said oh it sounds like an amp and now the helix they say oh it sounds like an amp so right. it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> i like that um oh kooky said you could use a beat like the tc electronic you can beam the preset into the guitar through the strings kind of thing something like that i don't know there's got to be That's a way to do it no i think that is a good yeah. idea um that's sort of like a old voice modem, I guess, right? Yeah. Cookie. Yeah. Um, can you explain the difference between um, sound imaging and image casting? Yeah, there's a couple of more convolutions in between the two that have to occur, uh, where we try and capture the characteristics of both instruments and then mash them together rather than just imaging one instrument. So we can image a particular instrument and if we can get the appropriate target and this is what mama bear was doing by the way years ago Mm. if you take a fairly non-responsive instrument um that doesn't have a huge personality of itself you can convolve what's going on with that instrument and then the acoustic instrument and then take the acoustic instrument and play its images through the convolved version into the other one, if that makes sense. Yeah, because Ty went on to say, how how is Aura different to the Acoustasonic? So that's basically the same. That's the, that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah, there's no real instruments in the Acoustasonic. Mm. There, are, there are creations of what we've seen as trends and patterns in certain types of instruments. That's why there's no names in there. It, we just There's no real instruments in there. Mm. Did you? I think, damn good. <laughs> no, it's great. Well, the thing is, I, I told you this before. I, I, I kind of wish I again with the app. I wish I could turn up the blend. Sometimes I feel like the blend's perfect. I feel like it's perfect for stage. Sometimes yes. recording, I think it's perfect. Sometimes I want more blend, but that's just the tweaker in me. I kind of wish you could assign each um, position of the of the selector to be the sound you want, because it's kind of hard to dial at the turn the knob sometimes while you're singing, because I sing as well and I've got to switch it. So I don't know. I, I get there again. They went they, a bit like Martin. They wanted the. They didn't want to confuse the user, but then you get people like me that want the advanced stuff. But I guess there's not many people like me, so they well, cater towards that, them. Right, Fender is a working man's instrument. It always has been. Hmm. It's got a legacy. Uh, it's got a following. It's got an audience. They've looked at the Roland V guitars and the Variax and this, and they didn't want to go anywhere close to that. Okay, and anytime they talked about putting anything besides a five-way switch and two knobs in there. It broke their product vision. Mm. So who knows where that'll go with them in the future. But 
I have to tell you, they have been wildly successful. So they really got a lot right. Mm. Oh yeah, people love them. Yeah. Um, and I really want to get Brian on here. So that that'd be amazing. Or or Tim, um, would it? Um, is the Telecaster and the Stratocaster, is it the same tech or did you change? I know you did new um, images, new sounds. Yeah, but there, there's, a, there's an extra signal path hmm. in the uh, Strat because of the way we handle the um, image and, um, uh, I'm sorry, the acoustic image and the electric blend in position four. Okay, but it's basically the same technology, but we... You know, all the filters are different. We use a different tone stack settings. Different. There's there's some multi-band comp compression going on in there, which allows us to get a bronze, you know, a, 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 a bronze string to act more like an electric guitar string as far as dynamic envelope, mm. uh, because they act so differently that we had to fix that or we had to constrain the bronze string certain ways and. So there's a lot going on under the hood in the DSP mm. that supports the images, the cab model, the string response on the um, acoustic strings, trying to sound like electric strings. Fundamentally, same technology, but I know that we had to put an extra single pass in there. And uh, we did some different things with the um, acoustic models, and uh, they're uh, more detailed than the um, in the Strat than they were in the Tele, hmm. uh, because the Tele is two years old now, and part of our new stuff and part of what we're learning. And I said, hey, when we worked on the Strat, I said, guys, I've been doing this. What do you think? And they said, oh God, yeah, we got to go there. So, hmm. Hmm. and at at some point we may do a firmware update on the hmm. Tele. I th I don't know. The Tele is still yeah. so back. They're not messing with it. I didn't. I, I had one of those briefly. I didn't notice a. My, I didn't personally notice a huge difference. I knew there were different models of you know, different different guitar kind of thing, but I didn't notice a huge difference in that. I'm just wondering if if Fender would do like an HD version or, or and I'm wondering if if they're going to make more guitars, which you probably can't tell me, but are they going to make more guitars and are they going to use new kind of algorithms in those guitars or, or even open it up to people to edit the stuff? I mean, I guess they could do that with firmware, right? I don't know whether they're going to. Yeah, they're pro, you're undoubtedly going to be more models. Um, whether they're going to change and make them geekier, if I can use that word or not, with editing, and they're not. I, I, I don't think they're inclined to do that. Okay, mm -hmm. I think they're really trying to capture a certain something about Fender that is uh, very simple, very utilitarian, really works. Don't mess with it. Worry about the music, not the gear. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. It's just sometimes. Well, no, I'm, I guess I'm thinking for customers. If they buy one next year, will there be like a new algorithm? Oh, it sounds even better, kind of thing. Is it going to be like that? Aaron, I think you're an exceptionally. Um, into, you listen to your stuff so much more than 99% of the people that they're selling guitars to. I'm not saying that in a bad way, but you focus on this stuff because you're a pro and you're a guy that is very. Um, interested in this and mm. at a level and you got an amazing ear uh, you, you couldn't sing as beautifully as you do if you didn't have an ear like that mm. okay you're an amazing singer thank i you, know thank that you. and that's not the average customer mm. in fact we know for a fact at fishman that 90 percent of our customers never play a gig mm. oh no i get it i totally get it and and i'm i'm not um <clears throat> the re I'm, I'm re I also I also realize that there's business and then there's enthusiasts like me, but mm -hmm. but the reason I ask that question really is because when I review these things I get these questions and I want to kind of have some information for people that are watching my channel. You know I know like, people are thinking that like should I buy one now or will there be a better one next year? Kind of yeah, thing. those decisions are strictly up to our customer. Okay, mm. I'm not in the guitar business anymore. Thank God. <laughs> 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 That was the most expensive hobby I ever had, by the way, in the park. Yeah, me too, <laughs> especially with pickups. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. It's got, it, it depends on the customer. If Chris Martin or someone there wants to try something really techy, we're happy to do it with mm. them. 
we have the capability to do a huge number of things. Mm -hmm. You can't throw it all out there. They are expensive to do and to support. So, you know, you can't, um, you can't do it casually. People have to be committed to it. Mm -hmm. And Fender is hugely committed to this line of guitars. Yeah. Martin's committed. Uh, we're now doing stuff with Epiphone. They're incredibly committed to stuff. Um, you know, it depends on the customer. Mm. On the Fishman side, our, our um, retail products, that's our own bailiwick right there. I mean, we went way out on a limb with triple play. Mm. And I still think there's going to be room in this world for triple play mm. uh, uh, to become much more integrated into people's guitar rigs than it is today. I like that too. Yeah. We're seeing it. So I can't tell you what Fender will do or won't do um, in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just like cars, man. You buy an Audi or whatever you're buying, and you know it's going to be very different in three years. And it kind of yeah, I agree with that too. Don't not buy today. It's like buying a computer. Don't don't not buy a computer today because next year there'll be a new model. Like get That's it, right. get it, and enjoy it for what it is. I I totally I'm I'm on that path as well. I don't, I'm on that um, train of thought as well. And I have to. I'm a little biased. I don't fall in love with guitars the way people do. I really don't. Mm -hmm. They're tools, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. They're just tools to me. I mean, I have six or eight double basses, and they're tools, mm -hmm. you know? And some of them are really great instruments. Well, another reason I love the Acoustasonic is because it allows a, someone, a player to have a guitar with no pickup or, or yep. you know, just a Fishman under saddle, passive, whatever, and then you can have that for stage. I also I think that's a good way to go as well. You don't have By the way, that was Brian Swordfinger. He said, it has to sound loud enough on your lap that you don't need to plug it in. Right. And he and Tim took care of that, mm -hmm. and so forth and so forth. That project went so quickly and was so successful because the customer knew exactly, exactly what they wanted before we even started the conversation. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he, and he's a really brilliant guy, the fact that Brian could articulate it so clearly to us and that Tim was totally on the same page with him. It happened. That happened in record time because it was, here's what we want. Bing, bing, bing. And we had to decide whether we could do it or not. It wasn't, well, let's try this and maybe we'll do this. And maybe we'll, there was no maybes about it. This is what we need. And we, we need it in less than six months. Hmm. So you did that quick. That was a, that was a fast oh, it was record time. And we got, got it, you know, into production and, it took a, a massive effort by uh, the group at Fishman that I pulled aside for this uh, because the project was a lot of fun and it was well defined. We knew there was an end point. Mm -hmm. Some projects, when we work with OEMs, don't ever reach an end point. Uh, yeah, but maybe, in, you know, those are difficult ones because the resources of the company get really strained when we're making multiple, multiple prototypes and this and that. And then, there's um it, it's it's part of being an oem supplier that mm. you go through that but um this one was went bang like that and uh it was it was because the the product designers had a vision right that was clearly articulated and believe me some of my own engineers try to muck it up by adding switches and stuff <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah you said that there's that a blend that says defeatable switch and then but you're right then you get to then you get that problem where other people i mean what, what percentage of the market is like me like this is right. my this is my 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 passion my hobby everything that i do most people just want to plug it and sound good but then again there's always those people that that find yeah, you know, when that first came out, a reviewer said it sounds like a, just an undersaddle pickup. No, no, it doesn't. Like, what well, are you listening to? Like, it's just crazy. Like, so, yeah. so there's this, and and of course the biggest thing was, oh, what are Fender doing? They should stick to their Stratocaster. Like, but why not? Why shouldn't Fender do something new and innovate and give us new tools to make music? It's a good. Fender's thing. always been an innovative yeah. company. Yeah. You know, look at the original guitars, and they kept innovating. When they came out with the Fender Rhodes piano, yeah, people. What are you doing? Yeah, you same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Fender does a lot of stuff <laughs> that is yeah. quite innovative at the time. Yeah. Wow. Okay, we've gone for two hours. Um, <laughs> really? Almost as long as Lloyd, but not quite as long as Lloyd. 
Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, like, we didn't even, I just want to say, we didn't even talk about all your pickups. We didn't talk about all the things that you do or have done, all your OEMs. I mean, you've had pickups in almost every guitar. Like, most, most guitarists have played your pickups. It's incredible, isn't it? It is. I'm, I'm flattered. Uh, part of it is uh, we make a lot of stuff. Um, we figured out how to manufacture uh, very efficiently, so our stuff's very affordable. When you put a system into a OEM guitar, the cost gets multiplied by 5x before it hits the customer. Mm. It's, it's huge, okay, because there's a lot of margin in there. And there's the install is all part of, you know, there's a lot going on. And then it's margined by the car, guitar company. So it gets another hit. And then the distributor and the, oh, you know, and the um, uh, dealer and so forth. So if you can't supply great stuff at an incredibly efficient price, yeah. you're not going to be in the OEM business. Yeah. Just not. And then you have to do the logistics. We've been manufacturing um, systems in Korea and China for 30 years because that's where the guitars that aren't made by four or five companies in the U.S., that's where the world's guitars come from. Mm, yeah. And we have to be there because they can't afford to import stuff from the United States, unfortunately, just the logistics and the freight. So we have to go spend time there. I can't tell you how much time I've spent in China the past 10 years developing strong relationships with great manufacturing partners. And um, that's not easy, but it makes our uh, ability to get into a lot of guitars. It makes that That's what makes it work, aside from our designs. But how, where did you get that skill from? How did you learn? I mean, that's a, that's a whole new thing, right? Like how did you... Do you have people help you um, do that? Or was that all you that grew the business to that kind of size with the OEM stuff? Uh, it started with Tim Shaw when he, I hired him because he had been, done all the overseas uh, sourcing for Gibson for years for uh, Epiphones and this and that. And I knew that um, they're making tons of guitars over there and I was locked out of that market. And I hired Tim to show me what's going on in Asia. And for, for two years, we traveled throughout Korea and Japan and met the people, learned, you know, went to the Young Chang Guitar Factory, went to the Samic Factory, all the factory, the Court Factory, um, you know, all the factories in Korea, um, went to the Japanese factories, got to know the people, saw how their operation worked, and um, that's what started it, and it just kept perpetuating, and it required, I got a lot of air miles. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's incredible. And, of course, that's important, too, to be able to provide reliable and good systems on that kind of scale. It must be a lot of um, pressure. I mean, like, uh, there's not many companies that haven't used your pickups, right? And I, I was thinking about it today. Absolutely amazing. Like, I've been almost every guitar. Like, really, really quite amazing. Yeah, I think we're in 80 brands right now. 80 right now? Wow. Yeah, I didn't even know there were that many brands, but my uh, OEM sales manager corrected me the other day. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, thank you. I mean, I think you know, I think we're in a great place, and I can't wait to see where it all goes. It seems like there's still a you know a lot that can be explored with all this. So there really is, and um, again, it's going to be trying to figure out what just like this pandemic i don't think we're going to be selling a lot of high-powered stage amps in the next year or two right i really, I really don't okay right. but we're going to kind of focus on stuff that is smaller scale people can use at home um you know but that's just being flexible enough to survive in a tough situation but it's also what we've always done we've got what does the market need that it doesn't have that's where fluence came from can we solve problems and do something rather than just jumping in and getting involved? You know, what, what's missing here? Mm. And um, so that's just our general philosophy. Because, uh, and everything we make has to put a smile on someone's face. We're not making toothbrushes, mm. we're making tools for artists. And if they can use it artistically and feel satisfied with it at almost any level, and we're not doing our job. You can take our lowest cost system with a sonotone pickup in it and put it in a medium quality guitar 
and hand it to a pro who can go on stage at the Grand Ole Opry or wherever and re have a reasonably good time in a successful show with them. It may not be their end all and be all, but it's got to perform at that professional level. Otherwise, we're not going to sell it. Yeah. So we have systems that are less expensive than our higher end, more featured systems, but they all have to work at a basic level where a pro can use it and have a smile on his face or her face at the end of the day. So, no, of course, that's very important. Well, I can't wait to see where it goes. I know we're going through a, a tough time right now. I hope everyone's well and. Um, um, I look forward to see what you do in the future, and I do hope you'll involve me with any um, uh, demos and thoughts on it because I'd love to. I'd love to uh, be involved with what you're doing. I think it's great, and I'm very excited. Like I said, the Aura HD really impressed me, and I, I, I feel like I feel like Marden again to, to, to praise Marden. I think they pushed you to put that in there, right? Like they wanted it. They wanted the HD. Well, I showed it to them um, before when they were developing the uh, Modern Deluxe series. Mm. And um, we were having some problems with it before, about four months before the show, three months before the show. There was an, an issue that we discovered hmm. la later in the day that was like, uh, we were really trying to wrestle it to the ground. It, it worked, except for uh, <laughs> certain circumstances we were having problems <laughs> And I told him, look, I, that was a sneak preview. It's not ready yet. And Tim said, well, I don't think we're going to release the guitars mm -hmm. if you don't put that out. You have to do this for us. It's too exciting. So we got it. And, and you know, our, 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 our head of uh, software figured out what, what the issue was. It was a consistency issue. So why, why did they remove the body sensor then? Did they have a reason for that? Um. Martin often looks at sales over the past year or two, mm. and for some reason, they sold fewer units of uh, than they did just the Matrix Enhance. Mm. Can't yeah. tell you why, mm. and they are very, they have a very sharp pencil mm. when they price something, mm. and I guess they felt, look, the Modern Deluxe is expensive to start with mm. you know I lobby on those things yeah. we make things available and let them pick and yeah. that's fine yeah. we we hope to support them in all of their decisions mm. the f1 and the retro kind of hurt me though i thought i think god really not doing that right yeah. i remember <laughs> but, i remember that like, like yesterday at nam talking to martin i think i spoke to skip the first time he said how did you get in here summer now he's like how did you get in here and I said, I came in through the door. I thought, oh, that's good. My joke was not funny. I said, but anyway, I love the retro. <laughs> no, right. I think, I think he's going to be on here on Tuesday. We've confirmed it. We want, we're going to talk about the SC13 because everyone's talking about that guitar. Again, a traditional company making a very modern type guitar. Again, you know, sure. the internet is lighting up. We're going to discuss that guitar. Um, but yeah, I, I remember him saying to him, like it's yesterday, I love the retro guitar. What's happening with it? He said, we just discontinued it. And I was like, why would you do that? <laughs> You know, uh, part of the problem with the um, F1 system mm. is, I think it was a mistake that was made by a, a past head of marketing and sales. They decided to come out with F1 analog systems, which were lower cost models, but they looked just like F1 or, mm. and people in the stores were playing, picking up an analog one saying, well, this isn't that great. Right. I think they made a mistake by showing two systems that were completely different with the same cosmetics. And I think the sales, I don't know what happens in yeah. this guitar store, how much people really know about what they're selling. But I think it could cause a lot of confusion in the marketplace. You're right. Marketing is very important. The way you explain products and put them across to customers. Yeah, very important. Yeah. Well... So we've now been over two hours. Thank you so much, Larry. It's been awesome. I hope we can do it again sometime if we've got a different topic. Um, maybe we can even discuss some products in the future on here because it's a nice kind of relaxed platform to do it. I think the people sure. the people loved it. We had a great crowd. We've still got 25 people watching now. Thank you, everyone. That's just in the chat, not even watching. Great, com great comments. Everyone loved it. I loved it because you know, you're a personal hero of mine, as I always tell you. And oh. This is like, for me, this is heaven to sit and just chat with you about pickups. You're embarrassed. I, Please. <laughs> I love it. Well, you gave me a compliment, so I'll give you one. Actually, I gave you a few today. <laughs> okay. You well, can you can I, have them. Uh, I do want to take 
um, to reschedule your visit to Fishman. And mm. since it's safe to travel. Yeah. Um, because um, there's a lot of people in the company that are inspirational to talk to and to meet, mm. and I'd love to have you meet them. I'd love to. Uh, because uh, we have people that create things that absolutely love what they're doing. Mm. and enthusiasm there and the professionalism is i am the most fortunate small business owner in the world my mm. crew is astonishing oh i don't want to i don't want to um you know of course i love having the founders and the ceos on here for their stories and how they've built their business but i don't want to discount the employees as well because i'm sure that without the employees you wouldn't have a business right so we have to we have to give them a shout out as well you need two things for a business you need employees and you need customers yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and Kooky says you're a hero for me too Larry and he'll see you on the acoustic guitar yeah, forum <laughs> tell Kooky I'm a uh, admirer I've seen his work mm. on the forums he is a persistent hound dog good for you buddy <laughs> you, just made, you just made his day and Gary as well thank you Larry for sharing your time and being such a genuine warm human being that's oh, awesome that's so fantastic nice. yeah Thanks, thanks, everyone. Thanks, sir. I think we'll start to wrap it up. So thanks, everyone, for watching. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate your time so much. Um, and please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I'm going to try to get some of the Acoustasonic guys on here. I'm going to ask Larry to help me with that. And um, yeah, keep watching because I hope to cover any future products and do some more interviews in the future. And love to visit the factory and also interview your employees as well. Why not? Yeah, be great. great. Uh, Larry, great. just hang on the line. I'll say goodbye to you once I end the stream. I'll just say to everyone watching, thank you so much. I'll see you next time. Tomorrow I've got my friend Evan Gluck, um, who's a local friend of mine, at 4 p.m. again. And I've got a gig tomorrow at 6 p.m. Everyone's invited. It's a private gig, but it's open to everyone. So please join me for that. And I'll see you then. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.